Oh, okay. The participants are entering the room. We have 71 attendees already. 80. Oh my goodness. Okay, I think we can start this webinar right now. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished presenters, participants, and committees. Welcome to the first SRS Teflin International Webinar focusing on the processes and policies of researching multilingually. It is actually the fifth webinar from the webinar series that Southern Region of Sumatra Teflin has been conducting since June this year. And first of all, please allow me to introduce myself. I am Nima Slarasati Utami. I am the student of English Education Master's Program of Srivijaya University, and I'm very thrilled to be the host of today's webinar. All right, let's just move on to our first agenda, which is the opening remark from the SRS Teflin coordinator, Professor Huzaima Dalandim, who has been continuously dedicating herself to develop English education for the teachers in South Sumatra through her ideas in SRS Teflin activities. The Zoom floor is yours, Ibu. Okay, Nima, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning you, or evening or afternoon. Uh, respected ladies and gentlemen, uh, although uh, Sari has already introduced me to some of you and I myself greeted some of you, but I still want uh, you to allow me to introduce myself. My name is Huzaimah Dahlandim, the coordinator of the SRS Teflin, Southern Region of Sumatra Teflin chapter. Teflin is the organization, the Association for the Teaching of English as a Foreign Language in Indonesia. Okay, we are very pleased to inform that SRS Teflin has already had series of uh, national webinars and the one today is the first international webinar which is focusing on the hot issues concerning research multilingually. Uh, in, in relation to these issues, as a matter of fact, we are very happy and I'm honored to have a chance to promote that all presenters today and the host, uh, but I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Artanti is not here. Okay. Uh, all of the presenters are the contributors of the book entitled Learning to Research Multilingually, Rethinking Practices, Challenging Policies. And the most important thing is that this forthcoming book is co-edited by our lovely Sari Silviani from Sriwijaya University, together with Dr. Beth Samuelson from Indiana University, Bloomington. Although uh, this book is now still under review, according to Sari, um, in Multilingual Matters Publisher, we as Stefliners hope that it will be published soon. And we academicians have to read this book once it's coming. Therefore, I'm very grateful to all the presenters who come from different parts of the world. I feel guilty if I don't mention every single name. Okay. Uh, Sipiani and Mateus Yumarman, 
Yumarnanto from Indonesia, although they are from different uh, provinces. Okay, Sari is from South Sumatra province and Yumarnanto is from East uh, Java. Okay, uh, second, Karen Muller, Dr. Karen Muller and John Adams Adamson from Japan, Brain Salesat from Morocco, Dion Park from South Korea, Hatma Sa'id from United Kingdom, and the rest are all from the United States of America, although from different states. Beth Samuelson and Jay Hyun Im from Indiana, Michelle Back from Connecticut, hmm. Maria Jose Botello from Massachusetts. It's an honor uh, that they are all with us at the first international uh, SRS Stefflin webinar today. And also I heard that our registered participants come also from even more various cities and countries with various backgrounds, such as researchers, university lecturers, teachers, and graduate students. Now, to show my praise and appreciation as the coordinator as of SRS Teflin in particular, and National Teflin in general, I would say welcome to both presenters and participants. Please enjoy the webinar today. Finally, on behalf of SRS Teflin, in the name of Allah, I will announce that today's webinar with the theme focusing on processes and policies of researching multilingually is officially opened. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Huzaima Dhalandim, for delivering the opening remark of today's webinar as the coordinator of SRS Teflin. Well, before moving on to the next main agenda, allow me to announce some information regarding this event. This webinar can accommodate up to 500 attendees but uh, we also provide the uh, youtube live streaming right now as we are currently live on youtube so if you have trouble with your zoom or you can't access you're unable to access it anymore you can go to our youtube channel srs Teflin. and if you have questions you may type them in the q a box that we have already provided uh, the, moder the moderator will select some questions pertinent to the presentations to be discussed in the Q&A session later. For those who are uh, watching from YouTube, we will also accept the questions from the comments that you write down in the YouTube section, YouTube comment section. And uh, our committees will also select from there. We, are also ha we also have the chat box right there. If for questions or comments regarding the technical questions not related to the presentation. And our committee will also provide the link for the attendance form in the chat box in the middle of this webinar. The data needed for your e-certificate later will be taken from the attendance form that will be shared by uh, our committees through the link in the chat box. All right. Moving on to our main agenda, which is the presentation session, I will hand over this session to our moderator, Dr. Sari Silviani, who is a lecturer at, at English Education Faculty of Teacher Training and Education, Sriwijaya University. She earned her PhD from the Department of Literacy, Culture and Lang Language Education at Indiana University, Bloomington, and her master's degree from the University of Arizona, Tucson. Her research focuses on trans national and translingual literacies in transcultural spaces and critical pedagogies in teachers' education and professional development. The Zoom floor is yours, Dr. Sil Sari Zilbian. Thank you very much, Nimas, for your very kind introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to everyone in Indonesia, in uh, Japan. I think it's still morning, right, Teron? I think we just like a few hours 
like maybe two hour, two hours different. And uh, good afternoon to everyone in Australia and New Zealand. Um, good evening to those of you in United States. I really appreciate all your um, participation. I know it is not easy to accommodate uh, people from all the time zones. So some of us uh, here I know um, should be very early, like I think Fatma Said in um, Arab uh, Emirates. Um, it's around 4 a.m. right now. And then for those in the United States, it's going to be kind of late by the end of this uh, seminar. So I really appreciate um, all of us here. And I'm, I'm really glad that uh, we can finally meet in the session after working together for over a year, working on a book project uh, without actually meeting. So we've been communicating, discussing, and you know, uh, we give you comments and then we have all your work. And I personally really enjoy all um, the writings and, and this is uh, such a really meaningful project for me. Um, I will introduce each uh, presenters later on um, in the session. Uh, but first of all, I would like to introduce my co-editor, Dr. Beth Louise Samuelson. She is also my former advisor and my academic mentor. So I'm really glad to be on the same session again with her. The last time we have a session together with, was in uh, International Qualitative Congress. Is that right, Beth? In Illinois. So that was like the last time that we were um, in the same academic uh, session. And at the time we were, uh, I think in the early stage of the book when we just uh, kind of talk about uh, the project, kind of like thinking through and talk with people um, who came to our session. And then right after that, actually, we uh, started to really put them together into a proposal. So, so that was a really, uh, a productive meeting. And now I'm glad that I can finally have another meeting together um, uh, in the webinar uh, for all of us uh, who come to, I think, near the end of the process in our book. So I really glad that uh, we have this. I know Michelle had talked about it last year, right, Michelle, to kind of have a, a session triple AL. Unfortunately, uh, with this situation, I think all the conferences were uh, postponed because of the pandemic that we are having. But I think the good side of this is that now we can actually meet in the same session from all over the world because of this uh, technology. So there's a good side of it, I think. Maybe if we, we did it in triple AL, maybe we will not meet some of the uh, you know pre presenters that we have today. Um, so hopefully there are going to be another one. But um, again, uh, Beth and I will be um, talking about uh, kind of introducing the book. And um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I think, well, now I kind of forget to reintroduce Beth. So Beth is from uh, the university uh, in the Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, she's now a chair, uh, 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 an associate chair, excuse me if it's, it's not uh, the right one, but I think that's the associate chair of uh, the Department of Curriculum Instruction. And, um, and uh, Beth is also, I'm not sure if, if you're still working on the book and beyond project, Beth, but, uh, but Beth is also um, a director and faculty advisor to the Books and Beyond project, a co-curricular service learning project by the Global Village Living Learning Center that supports storytelling and book publishing by elementary and middle school students in the United States and Rwanda. Her research interests include language awareness and the flows of English literacy practices across global boundaries. She has particular interest in understanding the nature of meta-knowledge about language and the role that it plays in critical literacy and language learning. So welcome Beth, and I think we can uh, start. I'm going to share screen on uh, some of the um, 
just a short points from our book introduction. So let me do the share screen right now. Okay. So, so as uh, Ibu Huzay has kindly introduced earlier, our book uh, is about learning to research multilingually, rethinking practices, challenging policies. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, we'll start from this, Beth. I think people are just kind of uh, have um, a very uh, familiar concept with multilingual research, right? What about researching multilingually? Um, what do you think is, uh, well, you stay on mute, Beth, your microphone. Thank you for that. Um, so it's important to clarify the distinction. If you think about the work that multilingual researchers do, clearly many of them are also researching multilingually. So um, as we will explain, it will flesh out the definition of what it means to research multilingually. It's really the processes, the policies, the procedures that um, accompany doing research uh, using more than one language. So many people who do multilingual research are doing research multilingually. However, we see mul researching multilingually, the study of researching multilingually as um, something that happens in um, many, many disciplines, um, not just in teaching English or teaching other languages or researching multilingual development, et cetera. Um, but uh, in, in many disciplines, uh, the process of researching multilingually takes place. And um, we're interested in, in theorizing it, um, questioning some of the assumptions that are made about, um, about what that means. What does, it, what does it mean to do research multilingually? Um, what are the assumptions that we're making about the process of doing uh, the work in more than one language? That, um, that, that maybe uh, stop us from really, really thinking about how, how best to actually train graduate students. So that was a, a major concern um, for, for me that when I initially started asking questions and thinking about this um, in a systematic way is if we, uh, we assume a lot about the process of doing research multilingually, what are we missing when we want to train students to do it as well? Okay, so um, this is the work that actually inspire us uh, in pursuing this, right? Um, in uh, trying to understand um, what is uh, research multilingually. So we're uh, drawing from the work of Holmes and colleagues um, on researching multilingually that is uh, the process and practice of using or accounting for the use of more than one language in the research process. So that covers the um, process from very beginning, that is the design of the project, and then uh, engaging with different literatures, not just literature um, in um, English actually. I think even though right now with the globalization and the push toward um, uh, uh, academic in, in a more global level. Uh, most of us, uh, I think, at least for me, as the um, educator in, in English as a second language, we refer to and engage with the literature that are mostly in English. But um, with the research in, research in multilingually, we also consider different uh, literature from writers of the outside of the you know English um, circle, as well as the uh, writing um, written in different languages, and this process also deals with developing methodologies and considering all possible ethical issues, as well as generating and analyzing data and also covering the issues of representation and reflexivity when writing up our publishing. 
And I think we will clearly see this process when we, um, uh, when we listen to the next uh, presentation that will touch on um, the issues that Holmes and colleagues um, uh, discuss in their research. So these are the issues that why we're doing this. I think Beth's already talked about uh, why this is important to, to consider researching multilingually. So especially when we are connected uh, as academic researchers, um, we need to understand approaches for doing research multilingually. Um, uh, I know Beth has a lot of experience with uh, international students, Beth, uh, do you have any, some of the anecdotes why uh, that, you know, these issues are important to, to talk about? Uh, well, yeah, there, I, I can share vignettes with you, um, but they, they, they mainly have to do with, um, I've seen students um, be worried about presenting their work, even in translation, um, but having done the, the bulk of the work in a language other than English, if they have a committee or a mentor who is um, not themselves really experienced with doing research multilingually, uh, sometimes there's a fear that they, their research will um, not be taken as seriously or um, that there will, that I think that sometimes even the, the mentor or the, the advisor can feel um, worried that they can't adequately assess the work if they don't know the language. I've seen that. Um, and then I have an experience when I first came here as a, as a, as a, a new researcher um, being invited onto a committee for an advanced doctoral student, someone that I had not um, had any, had not been involved in training them, but I was just invited to be on their committee. A Chinese speaker who proposed to collect their data in, in Mandarin Chinese and then translate it into English and then conduct a discourse analysis on the English translation. Um, and we had, uh, we had very interesting discussions uh, uh, with the candidate and also amongst the committee about what the incalculable losses are, what is gone when you translate and then do a minute, um, analysis of the language and the language choices on the translation. Um, translation can be done uh, with, uh, with theory in mind, with, um, with analysis in mind, and it, can, and it adapts well to certain methodologies, but um, discourse analysis. Uh, my example was to them, I said, if you have a, a passive voice in Mandarin and you have a passive voice in English, do the context in which those those um, that voice that that structure gets used in English does it match up one on one with the way that passive voice gets used in Mandarin Chinese? Um, and with my passing knowledge of Mandarin, I would I would say probably not. I mean, there are things that would be lost in that context. So um, having a situation where the student feels that they have to do this in order to make sure that the committee is okay with their work, I think forces the student to give up quite a bit um, of, their, of their expertise. Um, and also uh, it raises a lot of concerns and issues having to do with um, identity, sense of belonging, sense of efficacy in, um, uh, in developing their expertise. And um, so, so there are just a lot of issues that come up with the training of graduate students. Right. Um, yeah, as, as a former graduate student in the United States, uh, I can relate, I could relate to it, um, to all these uh, challenges that we have uh, as we try to um, deal with the expectation. So, um, so as the researchers who are doing uh, researching multilingually, um, we have to navigate the complexities of methodology choices and barriers raised by institutional policies around, for example, informed consent, data collection, analysis procedure, and even publication. So yeah, that's, that's really, I think, something that um, 
that we talk about right uh, in uh, in our uh, seminar classes, Beth. So we talk about how how um, faculty can, could support um, the students who bring all of their uh, all of these multilingual and multicultural background into the work. So. Um, I think some of the uh, presenters will also touch up on the issue of uh, doing translation so that um, the audience who do not speak the, the language will be able to, to understand and to appreciate the work, uh, the research work that they have done. And I think one of the things that I experience is uh, that the research training at the university have not accommodated um, the issue of how multilingual researchers uh, deal with this data. Like I, so whenever, uh, you know, on all the research classes, I think my mindset is in mon monolingual uh, perspective because I'll just always consider um, these English language speakers or not necessarily just the speakers, but also because of the global system just require us to have our work um, understood in just uh, one language. So how, how that's doing, for example, peer debriefing with people who do not share the same language and background. So what kind of translation work and what kind of decision that we make so that will, um, that can be done. So all that process can be done. And I think we not really appreciate all of this uh, work. I think Beth in the introduction used the work. It's kind of like a domestic work or like a housework. It's necessary, but not appreciated. So I think that's a, that's a really a, 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 a praise uh, to, to describe that, that process. And I think uh, all of us multilingual researchers have this experience that what people read in our work is the final product. There's no understanding of what kind of issues methodologically speaking or even um, epistemologically, like when we are dealing with uh, multilingual uh, research. Um, that lack of appreciation is one thing that also drive us to really put this work forward so, uh, so it can be recognized as, um, as a also methodological issue. So, so what are the focuses then? So these are the four areas uh, that we can see across the work of our contributors, as well as um, how we understand uh, researching multilingually. So the first one is multilingual communicative practices. So it uh, emphasized the communicative processes of multilingual researchers with the emphasis on their multilingual practices in connecting with their linguistics and cultural resources in working collaboratively within institutional contexts and building their reputation as researchers. So that's one of the aspects. And then negotiation of policies in monolingual and multilingual contexts uh, Michelle's work and um, Maria's work will also touch upon this issue. And this is dealing with uh, experiences with trust building with the research subjects, um, with the mentors, as well as the audiences. And then of course, this is the uh, very important area about methodological concern. So in this section or in this part of the uh, research of multilingually, uh, we discuss methodological concern regarding research that involves more than one language in terms of the researchers, the topic research, the participant and the data. And um, Mateus and Fatma were presenters today, I think we'll talk about this too. And then uh, the other aspect is navigating identities. Uh, this deals with issue with access, legitimacy of the work. I think Beth already mentioned that earlier equity and fairness around the choice that the researchers make. And hopefully the, the next presentation will uh, make these uh, concepts more clear by um, their autho-ethnographic perspective. So I come to uh, the last uh, point, any particular 
uh, reason for autoethnographic. Beth, Beth, I think we really talk about this, that we want the work that people put in this books, uh, in this book is from autoethnographic perspective. Right. So we wanted to, first of all, explore what people are experiencing. And so we were looking towards storytelling, really telling people telling their experiences from, from, a, from a, a theoretically infused perspective, right? Bringing in their perspectives as researchers, um, saying this is, this is what it was like for me as a graduate student, or this is what it's like to advise a group of, of graduate students who are multilingual and are doing work all around the world, or this is what it's like to, to work together as a group of like three or four researchers doing a project. Let's hear the, your stories. Let's talk about what this is like, because that is the first step towards making, making recommendations, making changes to how research methodologies in particular are taught, um, bringing in things that we know from what we've heard from people, these are things that need, need to be addressed in research training seminars and so forth. So that was really, that was really our motivation, right? We, we need to start with that. So what, what are the issues? What are people, what are people encountering? So we basically provide the space for the writers to be reflexed, uh, ref to rest, uh, retrospectively and selectively write about doing research and publication multilingually. I think we have enough of the, um, articles that are just kind of from a, a distant perspective. Now we really want to have the work that accommodate uh, researchers point of view in a way that it's personal um, because we know personal is also political. So that is really the space for, uh, for the authors to um, put their work um, from this perspective. So we really chose actually um, the, the works where we can hear or we can get a sense of their uh, autoethnographic perspective, not just from the distant voice. So that's really the key. And we, um, we have actually people, uh, many of the contributors are actually working together. So Maria worked with many of her graduate students. Um, um, Teron and John work as colleagues. So that's kind of like duo autoethnography or like a group. Auto, but it's actually a, a, a personal perspective that all of these writers bringing in into their work. So that's the introduction from me and Beth. And um, the next discussion will be, oh, we have Brian here already. Welcome, Brian. Really glad, uh, and Gion too. So I was I was doing the slideshow, so I couldn't really see all the other presenters uh, who was already in the Zoom. So um, I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one later on, um, and I will start. Uh, I think we will move on to the next presentation. Um, we have Michelle. Um, okay, Michelle, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to all our audience while you're getting ready with your uh, slides. Uh, so Dr. Michelle Back is an Associate Professor of World Languages Education at the University of Connecticut um, in the Knight School of Education. She works with teacher candidates in Spanish, French, Latin, and Chinese language education. Dr. Back taught Spanish and Portuguese and also work in Mexico, Costa Rica, Peru, Mo and Mozambique, and writing uh, travel guides, teaching ESL, and developing programs for the U.S. Foreign Service. Dr. Beck's research interests include world language teacher development and, professionali and professionalization, the cultivation of global citizenship, the intersection of race and discourse, the role of discourse in constructing identities, developing a pedagogy of symbolic competence and the role of translanguaging and multilingual ecology in transforming schools and other communities of practice. And she has, I think recently published in, is that Tissel Quarterly? Uh, 
Michelle. I think that's the current one that I came across. Yes. So yes. anyway, all right. So welcome, Michelle, and the uh, Zoom floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Sari. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are right now. I'm going to be presenting a little bit on negotiating participant distress and negative perceptions of language in multilingual research. And a little bit about um, my ideas for this presentation. The Actually, the, the first part of my title of my chapter is when multilingualism quote unquote fails. And I hope that I will show that it's not necessarily a, a failure, um, but that th it can lead to um, some, some issues both on a community level and on a personal level. Um, there could be things that happen such as community language loss, or perhaps a participant is um, really struggling with learning or teaching an additional language and, and to the point where they might give it up. Um, and then that compounded by if, if that person is actually under the purview of a researcher and then they see that researcher as an expert, um, that can contribute to a lot of stress if they're struggling with, um, with language maintenance or, or use or, or learning. And so that could in turn result into sort of a almost a failure for the researcher and the research process. So there are a lot of kind of interlacing issues with, with failures that can take place. And I just put this little meme about crying in Spanish because multilingualism and failure can take place in many languages, but it's a little lighthearted as well because I, I want to emphasize that, you know, this may not necessarily lead to total failure. Um, so the resulting questions for, for, for researchers when you are uh, working with, um, issues of struggle and stress with your participants um, is, first of all, you want to think about what your obligations are to those participants. And there, there are many, um, because as a researcher, you do really want to understand when multilingualism doesn't work or when language learning doesn't work and why it's not working so that you can make it better for people in the future. At the same time, you have kind of a, you know, an ethical researcher obligation to enhance the benefits that those same participants who might be struggling can, can reap from, from participating in the research. And so as you're going along and kind of making these choices at every step of, of your research, um, you're thinking about how, how are those choices shaping our data and, and our findings and, and how do our actions and our interactions with our participants um, position us as, as an expert, a collaborator, a colleague, or, or, or something else, depending on, on how, you know, how those interactions take place. So what I decided to do is um, I, I, I like to use a method called case stories. Um, it, there is a lot of autoethnography in here as well, obviously, because I'm reflecting on three previous research experiences that I had. But I'm choosing to tell them as stories, um, and 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 Maslinovsky and Ackerman talk about this as a written and oral description of a real life critical incident or dilemma of practice, um, told from the authors and in this case my perspective. And so these three stories um, are focused on um, a Quechua speaking community in Ecuador. Quechua is an indigenous language that's spoken in the Andes in South America. Um, a, a group of participants and one participant in particular during a study abroad in Brazil and um, a, a perspective on teaching Spanish in the United States. And so each of these were research studies that I conducted and I was happy to have this opportunity to kind of reflect on those experiences um, thanks to this chapter and really think about what were the choices that I've made and what were the inter and what were the results of some of the interactions or actions that I took or didn't take um, and how might that have affected um, the research that came out. So first a little background about me. Um, this is me, that blonde, that little blonde girl in the middle. Um, my first experience as a language learner came when I was studying abroad at age 15, which was a pretty young age. Um, but I was very stubborn and insisted that I go abroad at that age and my parents let me for some reason. Um, and I went to Mexico and had a real sink or swim approach. Um, my host family refused to speak any English with me despite the fact that they knew English. And as a result, I did not speak my home language of English for nearly three months. I 
was completely immersed into Spanish and it was a struggle and it was very difficult, but um, I did it. And, and that's gonna become relevant when I talk about one of my other stories. Um, my, I, you know, despite the fact that that was a difficult um, time for me, uh, I did decide to continue studying Spanish in college. Um, I received my master's degree in Spanish. I became a Spanish teacher for a while. I worked as a US diplomat in Peru where I met and married um, a, a man from Peru. And then I learned Quechua, the indigenous language during my PhD studies. And so because of my time in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Mozambique, I also learned Portuguese. So as it turned out, I was doing a lot of, at a, there was a time in my life when I was doing research in Spanish and Quechua. I was teaching language courses in Portuguese and I was also interacting at home in Spanish and English. So there were a lot of facets of my life that were um, taking place in many different languages. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. The first story that I wanted to talk about took place um, during my dissertation research and then um, beyond. And one of the main things that I found um, in when I was working with this community of Quechua speakers was that there was a real gender difference between the perception of Quechua's future in the community. Uh, the men who generally lived abroad, uh, they lived and worked abroad for most of the year, were very confident that Quechua would continue as a language, that it was inevitable, that it would continue in their communities. Whereas the women who lived at home and engaged in the day-to-day -day interactions in their community were equally convinced that Quechua was eventually going to die out. And one of the main reasons for that was that children were ashamed to speak it and that they, they refused to learn it. And because of that, um, that generational issue, Quechua was going to die out. And so I noted this in my dissertation. I, I dedicated a whole chapter about these gender differences. And then I came back or I went back to the same community seven years later to write my book and I discovered that those same children who I had spoken with a little bit um, at about age seven, eight or nine, who did not speak Quechua now seem to speak it pretty fluently from my perception. Um, and when I pointed this out to the same women, they were still convinced that Quechua was going to die out. And they claimed that the young adults who were from my perspective, fluent in Quechua actually spoke sort of a, a substandard or broken, what they called mocho uh, version of Quechua. And so this caused me to really question a lot of issues with respect to this, this disconnect that I saw between my perceptions and the perceptions of you know, the, the women in the community. And, and at first I thought, well, is it my lack of proficiency in the language that's making me feel, fail to see these generational differences in Quechua, um, even though they sounded like the same um, language to me, it was, it, it was obvious that the women didn't perceive that as such. Um, and on another level, you know, just kind of going back to the whole issue of making choices and kind of helping participants to, to look at what they perceive as a failure, should I have been a little bit more open or spoken more with my participants about these differences? Um, should I have gotten into an open discussion about how you know languages evolve and variety and no one variety is superior to another? That you know one's you know generational differences in Quechua doesn't necessarily mean that Quechua is going to die out. Could I have encouraged the parents to continue speaking it with their children? It seemed like. They were, but I wasn't sure quite what the result was in the community. So, so these were kind of some of the 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 issues that I had as a as a as a speaker of Quechua, but not one who I I felt was proficient enough to either parse these differences or to speak in a detailed manner about the differences that I was seeing in the community. So that was one issue that I had with respect to researching multilingually. Later on in my career, I looked, I did a methodological study about how we can use social media to measure language acquisition. And what I decided to do was follow um, three participants on Facebook as they posted about their experiences studying abroad in Brazil. 
one of my um, participants, I call her Donna. She was a, what we call in the United States a non-traditional undergraduate student because she was a little bit older than the rest of the group. And she really struggled hard during her semester abroad in, Braz in Brazil. She was very, um, she was very lonely. She, um, she had a really hard time um, making friends or really interacting with, with anyone outside of the group that she came with. Um, she was very negative. All of her social media posts were very negative about being in Brazil. And so once again, I struggled as a researcher because this was, you know, this was somebody that I had known before. She had been my student in my Portuguese class. And so I was trying to decide, should I intervene? Should I give her tips on how to acclimate? Um, I decided to stay a passive observer and just kind of watch this all unfold on, on Facebook. And when she returned, her first words out of her mouth were, you're going to be so disappointed in me. And, because, and she said that was because she, she felt that she had not learned Portuguese. Um, nevertheless, I tried to, to you know, just kind of push forward and do the interview, the post return interview in Portuguese because I was interested in language acquisition, um, doing the same line of questioning that I'd done with the other two participants and there was a real linguistic breakdown on her part, um, which you know led me to think not only about how I could have helped her while she was in Brazil, but also was, was my one size fits all data collection methods really what was failing? And could I have checked her proficiency or, or otherwise her knowledge of Portuguese in kind of a different way? So the questioning my methods was another thing that happened um, when I was looking at um, this particular case. The final case that I want to talk about is um, I was looking at um, the interaction of how does agency kind of influence, um, what is the role of agency on target language use in, in, in three U.S. Spanish speakers. And these three Spanish speakers were all white and they all had Spanish as a second language. And for this um, particular um, study I focused on Jenny who was a former also a former student of mine and who also seemed to be struggling with her with her class. Um, she continually brought up what she termed her non-native status as a Spanish speaker. This was something that was very relevant for her that wasn't relevant for the other um, the other participants who really didn't bring it up that much. Um, I think one of the reasons that she referred to herself as non-native was because she was teaching mainly native and heritage, what quote unquote native and heritage speakers of, of Spanish. So people who had Spanish in their homes and had spoken in the, with, with their family members and she had not had that exposure in the home. And so she was always kind of seeing the differences. Um, she also had some kind of disconnect between what I perceived as a disconnect between her practices um, and what she thought were her practices. And so things like, you know, she, she would say, well, I, I really try to avoid translating what I just said into English, or I really try to avoid explicit grammar explanations because I know that my, my, my heritage students don't like that. Um, but I observed her class many, many times, and she engaged in both of those practices pretty, pretty actively. And so there were so many questions that came up um, because of this, and this was really due to my multiple roles as a researcher and also a world language teacher educator, where I almost kind of, I put on my world language teacher educator hat, and I wanted to kind of make her better, so to speak, or make her more like, you know, what I wanted her to be. So was I, should I have advised her on her teaching practices? Um, once again, there was kind of an issue of Spanish proficiency because I only saw her um, using Spanish up in front of the class where, you know, I, if I had had maybe a conversation with her, I would have had more, uh, uh, more knowledge of how, what her Spanish was. And of course, there was all the discussion that is very active in, in, in the TESOL community about the whole conception of nativeness and non-nativeness. So that was, you know, that was another thing that I really wanted to, um, to dig more into. So a couple of implications of all three of, of these case stories is, first of all, I think that we need to recognize and, you know, in, 
and if we're looking at language acquisition, obviously we're going to need to, you know, privilege acquisitional varieties of languages and try to draw them out through different data collection methods. So if we're, you know, if we're looking at how people are learning languages and they're not, um, it, maybe, maybe they're not coming through with that in a traditional interview format, maybe we need to look at alternate methods of um, assessing proficiency. Um, another thing is that we might need to reflect upon our own abilities and languages used during research, um, especially for those of us who's, you know, the, the language that we're researching in is not necessarily um, a language that we grew up with and may not have the cultural and, and deep um, linguistic competence that we might have in other languages and the implications that these abilities or lack thereof might have for our analysis. And I think with this, you, you, you wanna have maybe more of a team-based approach and bring in you know, a, a member, either a member of the community or another researcher who might be a little bit more proficient in the language and, um, and kind of get that, that multiple, a, a little, some extra lenses on your research. Um, another thing that I wanna say is the need to reflect on past experiences with language learning. Um, and how they might impact our perceptions of participants in similar situations. So in my case, I went to Mexico at age 15, I did the total sink or swim immersion approach. Maybe that was what led me to kind of sit back and watch um, Donna sink, for example. And because I thought, well, it worked for me, why wouldn't it work for everyone else? And so, you know, kind of thinking not only of ourselves as researchers, but also as ourselves as language learners and how we learn a language might affect how we see other people struggling with that. Um, and, and finally, I think, you know, needing to reflect on the impact of our research or maybe even the lack, the lack of impact on, on participants, because I think that, um, you know, when we dig into our research, we think it's very, very important and, and everything we do. And I, and I think that we have to really be aware of participant agency in their language acquisition journeys. And even, you know, even though they're struggling, uh, they may not struggle always. And so I think, you know, giving them, perhaps giving them some tools to kind of have a little bit more autonomy and, and, and go forward with it and give them the confidence to go forward with it while still, you know, recognizing that, you know, they're giving them almost the strength to kind of make those mistakes might be um, a good, uh, a good way to go about it. And I just want to close out with an epilogue here um, about my three case stories. Um, that, that seven year gap that I had between my dissertation um, resulted in my participants not even remembering or recognizing me when I came back seven years later. And, you know, and I, and I, I had to really humble myself about that because even though I had been so focused on the research and so, you know, so concentrated on what they had done, um, they had forgotten it and, and I was okay with that. Um, as far as uh, the third story, Jenny is actually now the head of her district's world language program and regularly advises other world language teachers. So she's actually been able to move into a position of expertise where she's um, trying to make her district's world language program better. And, you know, and I, I, I commend her for, for, for doing that. Um, Donna is uh, a middle school Spanish teacher now. And in non-pandemic times, she engages regularly with a Portuguese tutor. She dances with a Samba club. Um, she now says that, you know, despite the fact that her, her experience was hard, it, her experience in Brazil was really good for her. And that she, and she claims that she speaks Portuguese now even better than Spanish. And so I wanted to end on kind of a high note here and celebrating with Donna and her Brazilian Samba group and, and recognizing that uh, once again, these um, these failures that we that we see as failures and the struggles that we see in our language learners are just one step um, on the language learning journey. And if we can emphasize that they're they're just steps and they're not the end in and of itself, I think that would be great for for all of our participants and um, the readers of our works as well. So thank you very much, Sari. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing the case stories. It's amazing that we can follow the process that, you know, that you've been uh, engaging with these participants in a quite long time span. You know, it's, um, yeah, maybe if there's some questions about that, and I would love to ask that questions too in the Q&A, like how you 
the going back to the community and reconnecting with participants because you know sometimes we just have this participant and then we're just not getting in touch with them but uh, with the, this research that kind of follow them and now we even know the ending like what they become it's so encouraging and you see that failure is not really like failures it's part of the process mm -hmm. of that thank you so much michelle and i will move on to the next one uh, our our next presentation will be um so we'll we'll be with uh maria uh i'm going to introduce her first so um, Dr. Maria Jose Botelho is an associate professor at Language, Literacy and Culture, University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's interested in how school literacy practices can be reimagined to affirm children's cultural and linguistic knowledge, as well as to offer tools for cultural production and social participation and reorganization. Her current research explores how critical literacies, multiliteracies, and world of language arts pedagogies converge and diverge in the research literature and in world of inspired and democratically organized public school. And she's also studying how critical collaborative inquiry and ethnographic research practices hold great promise for the professional learning of experience and pre-service teachers. Okay, Maria, the Zoom floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Sari. And thank you all for um, coming and it's an honor to be with all of you this evening uh, here it's almost nine o'clock in Massachusetts um, so today I'm going to be sharing with you um, some of the snapshots that we came up with in our um, in our revisiting of several studies that we were involved in and so I want to introduce you to my co-authors uh, first um, <clears throat> And so uh, here you see Dr. Masha Jingji Liao, who's at the right-hand corner at the top there, and Dr. Simone Galiota, uh, who's on the left on the second row, and Dr. Mukrin Wiro Chuchat, um, who's on the right side there. And then at the bottom, uh, we have Margaret Fellis, who's a PhD candidate. Um, and so I have had the privilege of working with these four um, marvelous researchers. And so we've come together because of our shared interest in language learning and literacy learning. Uh, my expertise is literacy, uh, but certainly we keep literacy and language and culture together um, as um, we considered these different questions that we're interested in. Um, and so we've done a lot of research that's ethnographically informed. Um, and so as I mentored uh, my uh, four advisees um, and and also reflected on my own work, I was noticing that we were doing, uh, while we were doing multicultural, uh, multilingual research, we were also researching multilingually and we were attending to all kinds of um, practices and choices that we were making both um, or across data analysis, um, data, um, um, well, collecting data, but data analysis, but also the ways that folks were representing their work. So um, we, we begin our chapter by looking at this piece by Holmes and colleagues and where they talk about their researching multilingually that um, <clears throat> yes, indeed, that there can be one more, more than one language in our research um, and that there are many possibilities and, and complexities that are associated with multilingual research and that research, the researcher makes purposeful decisions in all phases of the research process. Um, and um, and we found that that to be the case. Sorry, I have to um, figure out how to scoot the gallery <laughs> so I can see. Okay, there we go. Um, so we uh, we came together um, and doing these ethnographic accounts of our work um, to explore. Um, we were really interested in looking at the possibilities and tensions. So we keep those two words very closely together of data collection, data analysis, and representation as we shuttle between among inside and outside languages like English, Spanish, Aramani, Vlach, 
Greek, Italian, Portuguese, Chinese, Thai, and we worked across texts and contexts, some languages we know and some we are coming to know. Um, and so just again to highlight that the ways of, of knowing that we um, were invited to, to engage in, which was part of, of the framing of the book, was doing this ethnographic, uh, autoethnographic work. And, and we really uh, were very interested in, in how writing ethnographically would help us to document our inquiries, but uh, really documenting our research memories, memories as data and processes and practices, and the ways that these memories and processes and practices acknowledge and represent the presence of multilingualism in our research projects. We we're also very interested in how autoethnographic writing is an additional layer of data collecting and analyzing. So our many drafts of this chapter became also part of our data um, as we kept going back and revisiting um, the kinds of choices and practices that we engaged in in our, pro in our individual projects. Um, and then um, also our data analysis and writing practices, and we're drawing here on um, Richardson and St. Pierre, um, our analytical practices, but also the reading and the rereading of what was coming up, what was bubbling up as we looked at all these different um, drafts and, you know, and our conversations as we revisited um, our work together. So that what happened was this uh, almost this recontextualizing um, of, of all of these experiences that we had um, in, in, in terms of um, our shared you know, inquiries. And so <clears throat> next I'd like to share with you <clears throat> some of the, the theories or the thinking tools that we brought to this work. So both the uh, autoethnographic writing that we engaged in was very important, but we also um, found that these keeping these thinking tools closed, they nudged our thinking a little bit further. They <clears throat> gave us language to really um, attend to what we were noticing in our multiple experiences um, across these multilingual uh, projects. And so we, we were drawing here on discourse uh, from James G. Um, and so that um, that was very important in terms of really un keeping um, the understanding that language use and power are so intimately connected. Uh, we also were uh, drawing on Foucault's idea of power knowledge and that they're inseparable. And so that it helped us to attend to how knowledge production is intertwined with power relations. And so that helped us to really, excuse me, attend to the ways that <clears throat> we were researching multilingually and the ways that how was that knowledge production that we're engaged in and what ways are we interrupting power relations and what ways are we uh, maintaining, perpetuating. And so that really, um, you know, again, um, sharpened our, our, um, our analysis. And then lastly, the, the construct of positioning was very important because we know too well that language use uh, creates power uh, subject positions. So the ways that we talk, we use language, the ways that we use language in representing our work, our research, it, it can position us as researchers in particular ways, but also the communities that we work with or the texts that we're engaged in uh, and, and analyzing. And so these were uh, very, very important to our work. Um, and so I have next five snapshots, and uh, I hope I do them justice. Um, and they are um, giving you a taste of all of our um, reviews of what we, we uh, were looking at in terms of our individual projects. So here in our first snapshot, um, I should tell you, um, let me go back here, um, <clears throat> that we were really interested in... Um, and, and organizing the snapshots from the um, to, to kind of unsettle certain assumptions about uh, being multilingual researchers. And so what we ended up doing was we, uh, we structured the snapshots from the researchers who were more familiar with the languages of the communities that they were researching to the researchers that were least familiar with the languages. And we wanted to see what was going on, you know, because we have these assumptions that if you know the languages, 
then there's it's going to facilitate the research. There's going to be a greater ease, a greater success in you doing the work. And so we found that very helpful to be to do that. So we began with Simoni, and then we're going to go to Mukrin because they're both. Um, they went back in, in many ways to their um, their their countries um, to to do work. So Simone here, she was very interested in looking at um, how the um, how the critical pedagogies of Paulo Freire in Brazil and Don Lorenzo Milani in Italy uh, were uh, theorized or were still being practiced in these two countries. Um, you should know that Paulo and Don Milani um, they were contemporaries but they didn't really know of each other. We, we suspect maybe Paulo knew a little bit about Don Milani, but, um, and, but it's very interesting. They were doing very similar work in two parts of the world. And so um, <clears throat> here is uh, the school that Simone visited in, in now Northwest Brazil. You should know that Simone is of Brazilian heritage and she was born in the Southern part of Brazil. And she is the daughter of uh, Italian immigrants and they're from the southern part of Italy. So when she went to Italy, she ended up going to the northern part. So what ended up happening was that in terms of Simone's um, uh, visits to these two uh, school communities is, um, but I'll focus here on Brazil, was that, you know, she certainly you know, felt like an insider. She knows uh, Portuguese very well, um, and she's from Brazil. Um, but what she found was that there was a lot of um, you know, varieties of Portuguese that she was least not as familiar with the one that she had grown up with. Um, and so here um, we have here a stretch of a bit here of she she interviewed some adult learners um, in her visit to the Brazilian school who took classes in the evening. And then during the day, the school served, um, you know, children. Um, and so here is one uh, of the participants and where she um, was telling Simone about how um, um, I could read it in Portuguese, but I'm worried about our time. Um, but she was telling here Simone that she wanted to go back to school. And when she brought that up to her family, her daughters were in complete agreement with her wanting to go back to school. But her husband was questioning the, the, the decision. He's like, what do you think you're going to, at this point in your, at this age, what do you think you're going to learn? And so uh, Leticia then let Simone know that, you know, or, and, and obviously her family, that at the very least, what I will do is I'll go and I'll revisit what I already know. And what Simone noticed as she was uh, attending to this interview with this adult learner, they had um, been also a song in the background. It's called um, Asa Branca, which means... Um, uh, white wings and the song had a lot of themes that were uh, very similar to what this participant was um, talking about um, and so uh, themes of you know really a resistance and 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 really just um, you know making a life out of very difficult kinds of conditions and so but her uh, by her doing an analysis of both the lyrics of the song but also really attending to this participants um you know language use she was noticing um you know that that echoing of those themes but she also was noticing um you know how she too participated here in terms of what she says here at the end you know telling her what's most important is that you are a brave woman um, and, and who hasn't been discouraged. And so that she started to see herself also as an ally to her, um, you know, to, the, to this community member. Um, so that was one of, of, of the interesting uh, um, insights that she gained and in, in revisiting just how she was doing researching multilingually. And she really also found just attending to transcription, transcribing, that that was almost like another layer of analysis. Um, because we have this myth that, you know, transcription is, you do it verbatim. But in, you know, in this case, she was noticing that she was doing you know, discourse analysis in some ways, um, and and but also doing that comparative work um, across uh, you know the two varieties of Portuguese that she was dealing with. I'm going next to our next um, 
a snapshot. Uh, so this is a um, this is Mukrin's study. So Mukrin ended up studying ethnic and regional diversity in young adult literature in Thailand. Um, and she was very interested to see in what ways does ethnicity and class and gender work in these young adult novels. Um, and so you should know that Mukrin is um, she is a, 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 she's Thai of Chinese descent, and she was born to a middle-class family in Bangkok. And so as she, um, one other insight that she gained in doing this work was that in her own for formal education, she wasn't able to really uh, study the diversity of Thailand. In many ways, there is this ideology of the, the homogeneity of Thailand. Um, but these texts, what she was noticing was that there was this diversity across these ethno regions of Thailand. And so this text here that um, the cover here is, um, it's called Alukisan, and, um, <clears throat> and it comes from the northeastern part of, of the country. And it's actually an autobiographical text. And so um, what she was noticing in these texts was that, you know, that class and ethnicity were so tangled up, and in some ways, too, that ethnicity and race were very tangled up um, in these texts. Um, and by, again, looking at the, um, you know, the texts were in Thai, and so um, it really helped her to, to, to see the ways that language was playing a part in, in representing and enacting these power relations. Um, so I'm going to show you here uh, a little bit from that text um, that I, uh, uh, Luke Isan. And so here, um, what uh, Mukran noticed was as she looked at this closely and tie in the top and then the translation in the bottom, you should know that she also did, a, did most of the translations of, of the text that she worked with. And so as she selected chunks of text, she did the translation because she found that the, the translation for Luke Isan, uh, for example, was unreliable. She found that there were a lot of, um, the, that the translator had inserted a lot of, uh, or misrepresented really the, the, the cultural group. And so she then, in the translating, she also found that that was, uh, provided her another space of doing an analysis. So in this case here, you see, you know, that the Isan, um, uh, people here where they they are the majority in that uh, part of Thailand but still oppressed by the central central Thai but here they're demeaning the Vietnamese who are uh, the marginalized group of that part of, of Thailand and so what uh, one of the decisions that Mukrin made was she kept like here at Kao is a derogatory way of talking about the Vietnamese, but she kept that language because it was impossible to translate into English, but to also show the ways that, you know, that that language use was, um, you know, creating um, these power relations um, among these communities. The next snapshot that we have here is, um, <clears throat> and this is from uh, Marsha Jingji Liao. And so Marsha did her uh, study in a bilingual Chinese grade five classroom in the Northeast uh, United States. Um, so this is the school that she spent over a year in, and she was um, trying to see the ways that, uh, how this, the students were becoming biliterate was also contributing to their being bi critically biliterate. And so she was very interested in the ways that how language learning can um, and critical literacies uh, work together. So give me a moment here. Um, so you should know that Marsha is Taiwanese, um, and um, and so she uh, grew up um, with learning a variety of of Taiwanese in, in her home, and also Mandarin Chinese. And she's also fluent in English. And so, and, and becoming a researcher in this context, all of those uh, linguistic uh, resources were became very helpful uh, because she was able, even though this community uh, is using a simplified version or simplified Chinese, she was able to really, I mean, in some ways, translanguage 
um, across um, as she collected data, as she interacted with participants, whether it's the children or the teachers, but also as she generated the data. Um, so those linguistic resources were so important to her. And it also, um, the, 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 the students, there was a connection that she built with the students because they saw her as a language learner too. And so that they have this shared, um, you know, background. So she found that that really supported, you know, trust building and relationship building among the students and her, but also, um, you know, the the teachers in the school. Um, so here I have a, a little bit from her data, where she is sharing. Um, this this student here. Um, so you should know that in this community, the, the, the school is serving a lot of European American students um, who are, you know, learning Chinese as a second language. Um, they've also opened up the school where they are um, also serving a lot of um, bringing in a lot from a neighboring city or cities. Uh, some, uh, you know, more students. And so the, the, the student population is becoming a little bit more diverse um, in ter terms of race and class. Um, but so they had gone on a field trip um, and where the students went to a local field trip, just understanding more about eighth, uh, 18th century uh, practices um, in, in that part of, of, of the Northeast. And so, um, and, and, the, and the field trip was done in English, but when they came back, um, students were then encouraged to write in their journals and, and to kind of capture some of the things what they learned here. So this particular student here, his, uh, this student's name is Mo, which is a pseudonym, um, writes about, I saw one adult walking outside with a good ja quality jacket. I wanted that jacket and thought about how it would keep me warm. So in, um, Marsha, having been there because it was an ethnographic study, so she she was there. She hung out with the the community quite a bit. Um, she was able to see what the student was doing in this little um, entry here, and that in some ways he was combining his experience on the field trip with his present day needs. Um, she also found that he had used. Um, um, uh, a computer to do the writing, so to to do to choose the uh, Chinese characters, and so that there were some um, you know some issues with that because some of the characters were um, you know were homophones, so they had the same sounds, but they had very completely different meanings, and so she was able to do that analytical work and just to see the ways that the student was making sense of that experience, but also the ways that he was using. Um, I don't know if it's a boy or girls, but I'll continue using he. Uh, <clears throat> but he was using, um, you know, the the computer as a resource to generate uh, this Chinese uh, entry. So one of the things too she found because of her ethnographic work, she was also also able to approximate their meaning because meaning making because it was always it wasn't always possible to do a close translation. But because she had been there, she had witnessed, you know, and participated in many of of these activities, she was able to then, you know, do these approximate translations um, of, of what had happened and also uh, in terms of the student's writing. Now the next uh, is going to be Margaret uh, Fellis. And so Margaret's work, um, she has uh, done a study on uh, the Armenian Vlach uh, community in the Northeast, Northeastern United States and Canada. Um, and, um, and so you should know that in terms of, besides in the Armenian, uh, Armani, Vlach diaspora. This language is spoken in areas of northern and central Greece, Albania, Serbia, um, North Macedonia, and Bulgaria, as some of those um, areas. Um, and so Margaret, as a heritage uh, learner herself, so she is born was born into a Greek uh, commune, uh, family, and so she's a heritage uh, speaker of um, Greek. 
and also of Armenian Vlach. And so she's been very interested um, in these two uh, languages. Um, so she did a, a one-year ethnography and looking at these two communities in the, in the Northeast uh, Canada and Northeast U.S. And, and to see the ways that, um, you know, that the community was dealing or engaged with this, this language that's, um, you know, that's endangered. Um, and so she was very interested in, in the, the activities um, that uh, the community was involved in. So in the chapter, one example that she, she shares is, um, that's just a quick little map, is um, she had gone to a memorial service. One of the elder elders in the community had passed away. And so she was very, um, so she had gone to, you know, commemorate this uh, person's life, this woman's life. And she had noticed that um, near a memory board, the, um, the family had written these two words. And she was very interested in, in making sense of these two words. And what she found was that in, in many ways, what these two words were doing was that they were they were blending Greek and Vlach, uh, Armenian and Vlach uh, together. Um, and she um, was trying to understand what they, you know, they represented. So the first word, I wish I knew how to say it. Um, I, Margaret and I didn't have a chance to <laughs> for her to rehearse with me, um, but um, <clears throat> it means grandmother. And the second word uh, means precious or dear. Um, and so this again was part of the memory board. Um, but one of the things that was interesting um, for Margaret to, to look at this is that, you know, the, the uh, Aramanian Vlach language has been mostly an oral language. So in terms of its rep, uh, representation, um, is it, it is, um, <clears throat> You know, de depending where it's spoken, um, it folks are either using the Greek alphabet or the Roman alphabet, and so that um, you know it's not standardized in terms of its uh, representation. So she was, in, and in these two words here, you see some of that blending here too. Um, so what what she found in terms of her own work, um, you know, as a heritage learner, again, she went to the field with this idea that she's an insider, much like Simone felt uh, and Mukren too. But in engaging with the community, she also was positioned as an outsider just because, you know, she wasn't intimately involved with, with the, the cultural uh, activity and the ways that that cultural activity then uh, gave birth or enlisted, you know, the, the you know, the, the, this language. Um, and, and so she too found herself doing a lot of translanguaging and translating um, as she um, engaged with her multiple sources of data. And she also did a lot of member checks um, and, and that was very important to her. And, and certainly the other um, researchers did uh, some of that too. But again, that idea that Michelle proposed, that team approach that, you know, having multiple eyes on the data uh, was very important. Maria, just yes. a little reminder for the time. Yes. So we can move on to the Q&A later on. Of course, of course. I'm going to just go through this one very quickly. And okay. then, um, <clears throat> and actually, I could even skip my last snapshot and then folks can learn about it in, in the chapter. But um, briefly, this is just my experience um, and, and, and looking at uh, a body of literature that is about Mexican-American uh, migrant workers. So my first language is Portuguese. Second language is English. I can understand Spanish and French, but I'm not fluent in those languages. And so um, in this piece, I just talk about the ways that even though I'm coming to know Spanish, the ways that I made sense of these texts and the presence of Spanish um, in these texts, um, which was very interesting um, because, you know, it's not something that I sat down and said, I'm going to do this. But the more I wanted to honor the presence of Spanish, the more I sought out different resources to help me do that work. Um, so that's just an example. So I just wanted to kind of bring closure to these snapshots and that um, we are arguing that um, that it is not simply dealing with multiple languages, but that these languages represent histories, power relations, and position 
participants, researchers in particular ways. So going back to Holmes piece, right, and that they're saying, yes, we can deal with one more than one language. And we're saying, yes, that's true, but it's not that simple. And it's just not knowing languages and cultures, but it's also how researchers participate in these communities, who they speak with, what is said, what is not said, for what purposes, the context of interactions, and the researchers' commitments to the communities. And our work across these languages creates instances where we are constructing, deconstructing, so taking apart, reconstructing cultures through our translating, transcribing, analyzing, and representing. Um, and then our autoethnographic snapshots unsettle notions of English-dominated verbatim transcription and word-by-word -word translation. These snapshots make visible the social and relational work that the use of these languages can enact. And lastly, our autoethnographic snapshots offer insights into understanding our research practices and into multilingualism and context with the researchers as sites of cultural and in inquiry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for uh, showing us the snapshots of your collaborative work with your colleagues and uh, students at the University of Massachusetts. That's very inspiring. Um, I will come to the session um, where we will just, I think at this point, I'm just going to questions and then the rest of the question can be um, discussed in the next uh, session. So I'm just going to pick one from Windarati. This is Michelle. This is uh, specific to Quechua language. Um, so what about the other Quechua native speaker about the children or young adults abilities? Is it the same with the women? Uh, and from which point of view that the women starting stating the difference? So if you can address that question. Yeah, sure. So the opinion of the, the women were very convinced that Quechua would um, disappear and that it was essentially because, as, as I said, the children were ashamed to speak it and also that they didn't speak it well, that they spoke a very different um, version of it. For um, for the men who lived abroad, this was, um, they, they didn't really talk about this, but for the men, when I went back seven years later, some of the men who had lived abroad now lived um, in country at home. Um, they had not gone abroad for some time. And I noticed that their views had also become very similar to those of the women. And so they, they also thought that um, they were speaking um, maybe a different Quechua, um, but, but I really, felt this was most strongly from the women. And I think that the one of the reasons for this is that women are really seen in, in the Quechua culture, women are really seen as the preservers of the language. And they, they take that upon themselves very much. They're kind of seen as, you know, we're the ones who are going to continue this language. And um, interestingly, it doesn't really translate into them um, you know, they, they do speak to their children in, in, in Quechua, but then when their children respond to them in Spanish, they kind of just throw up their hands and say, well, there's nothing that, that we can do about this now. Now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's dying. And so, um, so it, it's, it I would like to learn more about it, honestly. I would like to go back another seven years later and see, see, see what happened, um, see if the, those adolescents are now adults who are um, speaking Quechua, but I think it really is an, an issue of, um, of, of, of time and, and letting things happen. For some reason, those young adults do think that it is important to keep speaking Quechua and they may be speaking a different version of it, but um, they, they're, they're still speaking it and they're still, you know, with all of the evolutionary changes. So uh, I guess that's what I would say to address that. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. We still have uh, other questions, but I'm going to save it for the next sessions. Um, so we'll move on to the next presenters. These two presentation will address the issue of translinguaging. So I will welcome uh, Theron Muller and John Adamson. Uh, before they start their presentation, please allow me to introduce them. So Theron Muller is an associate professor at the University of Toyama Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. 
and he's responsible for teaching variety of English as a second language classes, including English communication and English for specific uh, medical purposes. Um, she, uh, he's uh, involved in the in investigation of Japanese authors writing for academic publication. And uh, Theron will be presenting this together with uh, John. So John Adamson is a professor at the University of Niigata Prefecture in Japan. He is a chief editor of Asian EFL Journal and managing editor of uh, the publishing group, English Language Education. Um, so no, without no, no. further, um, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, now uh, the time, the Zoom floor is yours, Theron and uh, John. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. So I think at this point we can, we've been introduced, so we'll just get right into our presentation. Um, what we wanted to start with is kind of resembles one of Maria's snapshots to give a picture of the kinds of things that John and I were exploring through our autoethnographic investigation into translanguaging in writing for academic and publication purposes. Um, and this snapshot that I'm showing to you now kind of links back to Sari's introduction talking about multilingualism and um, changing languages, moving between languages. And it also speaks to a certain extent to um, Michelle's presentation where she talked about how while there was a kind of set research period, the people involved in the research, in this case, John and I, our stories continued um, because this particular vignette is from after John and I had already written the book chapter and um, comes from another book chapter I was working with with another co-author, but it speaks to some of the issues that come up um, with uh, using multilingual data um, in writing for publication and in doing research. So in this particular investigation, I was working with Colin Skeets and we had underlying data that was in Japanese that we had analyzed. So you can see the little Japanese vignette on the screen. And when we put it into the book chapter, the book, is, the book chapter is in English. So we translated the little Japanese vignette into English so that uh, the readers could see what the English was. And then we get a comment from the editor who's editing the book saying, well, I'm a bit lost here. I see Japanese and English because the claim we have is that the description only appears in Japanese. So the editor's saying, well, you say it only appears in Japanese, but you've presented it in English. So there's some kind of a misrepresentation going on here. And so what ends up happening is how we've represented language ends up being reflected kind of more explicitly in the book chapter. So the brown text you see there is text that we add based on that editor's comment in order to respond to the comment the editor has made where we explain that we've translated the Japanese and we kind of make the language more explicit in the chapter. And that's the kind of thing that John and I were trying to explore through the autoethnography we did. And next, I think I'm gonna pass it on to John to talk about translanguaging. Yeah, um, as you see from the title of our presentation, we, we're using the word translanguaging predominantly. And let's just look at a, a little bit of the, the definition of it, first of all, and we see First of all, um, we can say it's the adoption of bilingual supportive scaffolding practices. Uh, scaffolding is an interesting kind of key point there. We can also sit, look at the idea in the middle here. It's, it, it kind of works in multi-directional ways that honor and respect the history and identity of the interlocutors. And that research by Lian Kanagajara is pretty important for what we're talking about today. We'll talk about later a bricolage, which is formed. Um, basically then, in practical terms, so translanguaging views, language use, and the negotiation of languages is quite a fluid and dynamic process. It's happening minute by minute in many cases, especially in the classroom. Um, it's a messy concept. It isn't necessarily very well ordered or planned. It just happens in many cases spontaneously. So with that kind of definition in mind, let's move on to the next slide. Um, what Theron and I were doing then in our study was engaging in a collaborative autoethnography. And we've got some very, very insightful presentations before the one today to give you, an, which has given you an idea of that. But just to recap then, 
when you're doing collaborative autoethnography, you're, you're jointly constructing your narratives. It's not just one person giving a narrative and then another person. You're constructing it together, which is very helpful. Um, it kind of provides a discursive space for voices, both voices, let's say, opening up and democratizing the research space. So it, in essence, then what we did because we were working distance, as we have to do in many cases nowadays, even though we're in the same country, uh, we can't meet physically. We worked through Google Drive and Skype conversations. Yeah, it was a very, very useful way. Uh, we, we organized, first of all, about 10 frames, uh, which are 10 kind of ideas, uh, kind of in, like starting points to make a discussion about our, our research. We wrote the narratives and then we responded to each other's narratives. And that was a very useful process because it asked each other to expand, clarify, et cetera, on what we've, what we've written. And that's the key point in differentiating between collaborative autoethnography and just a normal narrative. Then we did a discourse analysis of, of the autoethnographic text. And then with all this enormous amount of data, of course, we wanted to crystallize things. And we crystallized them into kind of three basic themes, and we'll move on to that later. Can we go to the next slide then, Kieran? Um, for our findings then, let's, I think this is the most interesting thing for the audience today. Um, the first thing was about translanguaging in research practice, which is a common theme of what the other presenters have spoken about today. But just to tell you a short story, and uh, the, the quote here at the beginning, it says, how Anglo-centric Anglo I was by imagining that all research-related talks should be in English. Well, let me provide you the context. Uh, Theron and I were setting up a research group in Japan with Japanese and non-Japanese researchers. And the meetings were held uh, in English. We talked about our research products and presentations in English. But then at one moment during one of the meetings a few years ago, I noticed two of the Japanese participants kind of repeating and clarifying things that have been said in Japanese. And I felt to myself, I didn't say anything, but I felt to myself, oh, oh they're, 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 they're talking in Japanese, but we just spoke in English. And that was kind of a really really on reflection, quite a bad thing of me to say, <laughs> but I reflected upon it and I wrote it in a collaborative autoethnography. And clearly then it made me realize that the processes of translanguaging between Japanese and English were absolutely essential to negotiate and clarify meaning for the final product in English. Let me hand you over to Theron. Okay, so I've got uh, two different um vignettes that speak to um, the three themes that we pulled out from our autoethnographic data. The first of those has to do with a paper for a Japan-based journal that I was working on with a colleague of mine at the time. And we had underlying English and Japanese data um, from interviews with students that had been written up into an English manuscript that we had submitted to review and we received back from the journal a Japanese language review of the English manuscript. And so my colleague came to the research collaboration with better Japanese language skills than I did. And I came to the research collaboration with more experience of writing for publication than he had. And so what ended up happening in that process was he would help to interpret or translate or um, help to understand what the reviewer was asking for us to do in terms of changing the manuscript to meet the requirements of the reviewer. And then I would end up working on the manuscript, changing the, manu the language in the manuscript in order to meet the reviewer's request because while he could understand what the reviewer was asking for, he had trouble understanding how to contextualize that in the data. And while I could envision how to contextualize it in the data, it was difficult for me to access uh, the meaning that the reviewer was trying to communicate in terms of how we needed to change the manuscript. And one of the points that's worth kind of picking up here is one of the important parts of the concept of autoethnography being a joint autoethnography is 
I wrote about this episode, but it's John who ended up picking this up and saying, oh, this yeah. is really interesting data. Yeah. This is something yeah. that we should include mm. in the chapter and talk about. Yeah. And then um, the second one comes from, and the second one is also one that I wrote about and then John ended up picking up on and saying that it was important. Yeah. But the second one was me investigating task-based language teaching in the classroom. And I had data of students talking to one another and when I analyzed the data, I found that there was Japanese at the beginning and at the end of the conversation that they used to kind of frame the English language conversation that they were doing as part of the task. And when I went to analyze it, I kept reading different sources, trying to find sources that talked about what to do with this non-English language data. And I found that in the literature, it seemed to be that they would, the, the discussion was, there was only English data. There wasn't non-English data to analyze. And when I ended up talking with people, what I found was that oftentimes when they did the analysis, the assumption was, well, it's an English classroom. The only thing that's important is English. So even if there is non-English data, they just ignore that and they analyze mm. the English data, which I, at the time felt was really problematic but I needed to move forward with the research process. And so I kind of followed what other people had done, but in reflecting on that experience, I realized that um, like doing this autoethnography with John helped me to realize how problematic that is. And then now John's gonna share. Yeah, uh, the next slide then looks at the, the next sort of, um category of analysis, the next kind of crystallization, where we looked at translanguaging in terms of our teaching practice, our pedagogic practice. And this map was drawn by a student some years ago. Now, I teach English for academic purposes, among other things, at uh, the undergraduate level. And after one year's mm, English lectures, sort of very, very scaffolded lectures, a lot of language support, I asked my students to write a report based on a choice of questions. And after they had struggled the way through this challenging English language report, I said to them, well, wh where did you get all your information from? Who did you consult? Who were your brokers, yeah? Your literacy brokers, your language brokers, etc." I mean, because I wanted to find out what was going on behind the scenes before they submitted their product of, English lang of an English language report. And I got them to write these little maps as you see here. And it was quite interesting because it was very clear to me that they were referring to not just um, English language articles, but Japanese language articles, which was very interesting because the themes of the report asked them to, for example, talk about the economic revitalization of their region in Japan. Well naturally they're going to find more relevant materials in Japanese than in English about that. So it was good that they were referring to uh, multilingual uh, uh, resources to achieve an English language product. Also they were referring uh, to other people, Japanese people, who would maybe uh, help them in the construction of that text on a hmm, conceptual content level as well as linguistic level. So it's not all about English. It wasn't a monolingual process going on there. And the map proves that. Yeah. OK, let's move on then. All right. So this is our last slide. And we're just going to try to bring what we've been sharing to a conclusion. So in terms of um, one of the research conclusions that we, came, that, we, that we had was that there's a lot of discussion in the literature of people from outside of Anglophone, having been educated from outside of Anglophone contexts doing translation in their research practice. And in this case, uh, John and I are both, uh, I'm from the US and he's from the UK. So we're both Anglophones doing translanguaging in our research practice outside of Anglophone contexts. So that was one of the research findings we came to. And we also found that doing the autoethnography, thinking about multilingualism in our research practice helped to take the unseen kind of multilingualism that was going on and to make it more visible or to help it to manifest in our mm -hmm. practice. And another thing we found was that um, there's a lot of moving between languages, which is what Lee and Kanagaraja refer to as a kind of bricolage. In their case, they refer to a research participant 
who was Korean writing an English language manuscript and referring to Korean resources and English resources in order to produce the English manuscript. And in our cases, we also saw similar processes having Japanese source data and Japanese reviews and working on a, changing an English manuscript or revising an English manuscript in order to take that into account. And then finally, we're both teachers. And so there were some pedagogical implications to our um, investigation that we wanted to talk about. And that's that translanguaging is a natural characteristic of multilingual social action or so, multilingual social interaction. And so it's doing this kind of an investigation helps to legitimize that translanguaging, helps to legitimize moving between the languages. Do you have any final remarks, John? No, I think the, that final point you made about uh, legitimizing the local language is, is key in my mind. And I saw it in my data, and I think you saw it in your data, especially when you mentioned that the Japanese text you know, you weren't allowed to analyze it. And I questioned you in the collaborative autoethnography. I think that was a key point for, for me in legitimizing the, um, the, the Japanese language. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theron and uh, John, for your presentation. We have some questions, but I think we will wait after the next presentation, which is also about translanguaging. And I would like to welcome Brian Silstad. Hello, Brian. Uh, you're still on mute, Brian? Yes, yeah, sorry, great. Hi, everybody. Hi, how are you? I think last time we met was in Doctoral Research Forum in TESOL, yes. uh, Chicago. So that was really nice right. to see you again here. Likewise. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, before you start, I will introduce you to our participant today. Okay. So um, Dr. Silstad is a is the Dean of Global Engagement at American College Casablanca in Morocco. He holds a PhD in education from the, uh, the Ohio State University and has 16 years of experience in development and education in Morocco and the United States. Um, so today, uh, Brian will present about translanguaging based on uh, your dissertation research, right? Okay, the That's right. floor is yours. Great. I hope everybody can see the screen well. So um, the, like everybody, we're struggling with the managing our time. So I'll do my best to do, to go through things well and quickly. So um, thank you for organizing this time. It's been really a pleasure to work on this, this volume with everybody. And especially I appreciate the reflective stances that everybody has been bringing to it. So um, I'll try to do that. And my goal through this time is to, to share a bit of my own experience doing research multilingually and then to um, share a vignette a little bit for um, that was, I think, interesting and reflective for me. So when I came to Ohio, I mean, I'm a white guy. I'm white. I'm from Montana. I was raised essentially monolingually in Montana, but my own life journey brought me through Peace Corps and I acquired or worked on a lot of languages in terms of Greek and Latin. I have a master's degree in classical languages, but then I did Peace Corps in Morocco. And that was where things really shifted. So my now, after say 15 years of working and being in Morocco in different ways, I, my Arabic is quite strong and Moroccan Arabic and French is pretty strong. And then other, um, you know, I I've, I've can kind of make things work a little bit in Spanish and other things. And what I'm going to say a bit today has to do with like, you know, translanguaging troubles all of those natural, those national named languages. And um, I think there's some other interesting things that it does and helps us to, I hope, do work that is, um, you know, humanizing within the, uh, the traditions and spaces that we're at. So, you know, when I first came to Central Ohio, I didn't know exactly what I was going to be working on, but I knew that I was interested in things like migration equity, language learning, you know, schools and so on. So um, when I got to Ohio, I had a sort of maybe stereotypical idea that, that Ohio was not very diverse. And in some sense, it isn't as diverse as many places around the world, but Ohio and especially the central area that I was in had experienced what I, what I attached to or what I felt was useful with this concept of super diversity. So, you know, Vertovec and many others have been working on this idea of super diversity where you have 
rapid demographic change going on across a short period of time in multiple categories. And yes, it's problematic in some ways because it's kind of based on a Dutch experience of, you know, small Dutch cities going from like, you know, getting a lot of uh, African and Asian migrants and kind of having some challenges around that. But it, but super diversity itself, the people who write about it, try to take a very positive stance towards this issue and try to um, think about how this, this allows for interesting things to emerge. And if we have a positive stance towards the kind of um, flows that people have and the complexities they bring in terms of migration status, labor status, um, of course, language, languages spoken and so on, there can be some interesting things that emerge. So I felt that, that in writing my own around, around my own dissertation, that super diversity was a relevant uh, framework for uh, Central Ohio. And then translanguaging um, was very also important. I would, knew I, I wanted to be working with, uh, you know, bi and multilingual people in different ways, using my own linguistic repertoire to, to do some kind of work. And, you know, this was a, a theory that when I started my PhD, I was not aware of, but I was glad to learn about it because just as already has been said, you know, this is just, Translanguage is just a way of discussing the regular everyday languaging practices of bi multilingual people. I mean, most people around the world live in bi multilingual contexts, and I'm you know living one now in Morocco. And I think even you know many people who are in what are kind of quote unquote monolingual contexts, you know, are just maybe slightly unaware of how how much um, you know language varieties are that flow through things. But so translanguaging is just you know the natural way of of doing language, and it's just when I say that I feel like the trans part just puts a height uh, additional twist on it when we're talking about the inclusion of different national and named languages. And of course that, that idea of a national named languages indexes the power and so on that comes when we put a language label onto whatever a dialect or so on. And it's, and I think though that it's important for us to, to keep in mind that that uh, trans language is just the way things are. And it has, at least I kind of attached this to the work of Garcia, Johnson and Seltzer when it comes to being an educator or being a researcher in that, you know, your, our, a person's stance towards trans languaging is, is very important. Do we value it in general? Do we think that, uh, you know, of course we know there are regressive people out there who think that whatever English or something is the only thing that ought to be spoken in the world. Um, but obviously we're working, I think we're all working against those kind of things. But I think most people um, come to a situation and have to think about their stance. And then when they're in, in a classroom or when they're doing their research, you know, what is the design of their approach to translanguaging and how does it going to emerge? And then the last piece is shifts. You know, how are we going to be shifting our, our use of language or methodologies or pedagogies as, um, as things evolve in interaction. So the, the, the next part that I think is really important for me anyway, is that to talk about the linguistic repertoire. And this is a key part um, or, you know, rhymes also talks about the communicative repertoire. But for me, um, thinking through, what does that mean? I, 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 when I was doing my own work, like people talk about the linguistic repertoire, but I feel like there can be more work on what that actually means. So I, I in this chapter, discuss for me, what are th three important aspects of the linguistic repertoire. So one for me is the individual aspect that, you know, we all as people have linguistic, language, cultural, various knowledges that we bring to any interaction. You know, like I said, we've all described kind of our linguistic journey. All of us have said, you know, I'm a, you know, I learned Japanese or I spent three years in, in, uh, in Mexico or whatever. We've all been kind of describing this, this competency that we bring as a person to a, a specific moment that happens in, in, in life. And then what happens in that moment is uh, how we can deal with that moment and has a lot to do with um, that, that own background. But then I think a second part that's really important about the linguistic repertoire that, and I think that's the first part, the individual is what a lot of people are talking about when they say linguistic repertoire. But I think there's at least two other pieces that are really important. The linguistic, rep the social aspect of linguistic repertoire is really important in that other people that are around a moment, a context, have their own linguistic repertoire and their own skills. And the, the meaning making that goes on between people in that time is everybody drawing on their own linguistic repertoires to make meaning together. 
And so, you know, obviously some basic things happening is how, you know, when you're talking to a person you accommodate one other's linguistic variety and you, you know, like my, my son and I was, was listening recently to British English. He's seven years old. So he was listening recently to British English and Australian English. And he was kind of intrigued. Like, wow, I can understand that. It's a little bit different. But, you know, the social aspect is really important because we're all drawing on these different different um, people around us to make meaning. And if you get a big enough group, you can make a lot of meaning together. Sometimes it might be challenging. And then, oh, I'm sorry, my, my slide, I, I, was, I didn't finish my point on multi, multimodal. This is a thing that I think, another thing that's very interesting. In the modern world, um, you know, things like Google Translate, the various digital or computational tools that we might have at our disposal to help make meaning are maybe undervalued, especially when it comes to schools or any kind of context where meaning making processes are a bit more, let's say, um, stretched out or you have a little bit more opportunity to slow things down and actually try to make meaning together. So when students uh, you know, are not understanding something and they're pulling up Google Translate and they're trying to understand it, just as a few of other people have talked about, this is really important and, and maybe undervalued. We're not at a point yet where we have like the Star Trek universal translator where um, everything happens in one second, but there are a lot of interesting technological tools that are coming that make meaning making, making come together. So I'll just, uh, the uh, how this kind of comes together when doing ethnography, I see that there's sort of at least four approaches that researchers can take. You know, one, of course, it's really nice if, you, if your own um, linguistic repertoire aligns well with the people you're studying with, and we've already had people mentioning that. Um, sometimes it works very well when the participants have become proficient in the researchers' um, linguistic repertoire, you know, such as people who have learned let's say English well. Sometimes it's, it works well when you're, the researcher learns the language of, or the, expands their linguistic repertoire to become more aligned with the participants. And of course, the last one is to work with experts. And many of these things have been mentioned already as ways to do ethnographic work um, with people that, with whom you may share your linguistic repertoire, but there's like, I think many people said, there's never a time really where researchers and participants, linguistic repertoires are like 100% aligned. There is always some of that feeling of like insider, outsider, and how we negotiate that is the challenge. So I just, um, you know, I think that I use the term translanguaging methodology for research in that, you know, when enter entering a linguist or a research project, you know, having a stance to using my or whoever the researcher are, the full linguistic repertoire in all its aspects to try to make meaning with participants, um, in doing things like member check and so on is all that is very important to design your research to to really engage with participants around important topics and then shifts shift appropriately as context and things evolve. So I'm going to take the last few minutes to talk about a research the research context I have and then share a little a little vignette that I think was illustrative. So I did my, re my dissertation research at an adolescent newcomer program in Central Ohio. This is um, because of the super diverse nature, there this school has like a more than hundred national named national or named languages in it. Um, I the I followed one classroom of um, newly arrived high school age students, so like fifteen to twenty one year, years old, and in the class there are about fifty students that kind of kind of flowed in and out in kind of a core group of about twenty students. Throughout the the class, there were Spanish, Portuguese, Nepali, Somali, Arabic, French, and Kimbembe speakers. And then for me, you know, I was fairly able to interact well with people who spoke Arabic and French. I could even work reasonably well with Spanish speakers. Nepali, some of the Nepali and Somali students knew English fairly well to interact with. But, you know, it was, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges around making meaning together, which the vignette will show. Um, and so I was really focused on doing an institutional ethnography that was looking at how well this school, um, you know, met the the recognize and understood the students' home languages and cultures, and really wanted to know their perspectives in parallel to the teachers, administrators, and so on. So I, I have about 140 hours of video recordings of the class, you know, many, many interviews, artifacts, and so on that, that are used to, you know, warrant a basic argument that the school could do a lot more to make, um, to support these learners and uh, that's the whole thing that comes up in the, in the dissertation in the book that will come out in March. 
So this is just a visual representation of how the class kind of looks. It starts at the top with kind of a smaller class and then more and more students arrive. By the end of the year, you have a lot of students from a lot of different places all learning and working together using Google Chromebooks and so on to, to learn English. That's, that's the main goal of the program, but also to communicate, interact with, with each other. And then I was in the midst of it, you know, trying to support the students um, as a participant researcher, but also, you know, trying to get to know them as people and learn their journeys and try to understand their experiences as much as possible. So I'm going to share the last few minutes here, a data example. So um, one of the interesting things was there, again, there are a lot of students that came to the school. And one of the students that became fairly close with me was a student named uh, Gabriela. I call her Gabriela. The, she's from Brazil and she was primary, primarily Portuguese proficient, but a beginning English language learner. So, and then I'm, you know, American male, my, link, my main na national name languages are English, Arabic, and French, and some Spanish or Latin. And interestingly, the school, despite the fact it had a lot of bilingual assistance, did not have any pro uh, proficient por Portuguese speakers there. So in terms of doing the ethnography with, um, with Gabriella, I spent a lot of time, you know, sitting with her, trying to help her with various tasks, and then doing my best to draw on my, my full linguistic repertoire, including my own background, the other students sitting around us and you know google translate and other kinds of things on phones to try to understand each other so the setup to this vignette that i'll share here is that on you know it happened on november 21st but there's a long buildup of three months of sitting together talking about things and you know going from basic stuff you know your name and so on to starting to discuss her migration status family issues, she's got boyfriends, you know, those kind of things, just getting to know adolescents takes um, quite a bit of time and, and, and trust building. And um, what happened in this moment, I think is illustrative of how all of that kind of prior work led to a, a really powerful moment. And then, you know, it can go beyond that. So, so this is just in the library, an example of us talking. I always held, carried a little microphone in my hand to record conversations. So the best thing that I can do right now is to show the transcript. Now, I don't know if the audio will work. Let me try to play the audio and you, can, you all can tell me if you can hear it. It's about a minute and a half of this, of this um, excerpt. Can you hear that? Mm, I can't hear anything right now. Okay, it may not, it may not work. So. Um, I think anyhow, I can just kind of read through the, the transcript quickly. So, so I started off with in the library, we had talked about a bunch of stuff. And then I am saying to her, you know, do you speak? Do you read books? She says, yes. What kind of books? And then she starts, she uses Portuguese. You know, I, I have the tango. I, I don't, I'm not going to embarrass people with my, my stuff in Portuguese, but she, she says she's an application. And then she goes on to talk about this, this, this um, Wattpad gay and, I'm confused at this moment. I say, oh, this is for books. It's an online application. I had no idea what she's talking about. And then she's explaining it that she likes to do romance. I briefly bring up a, a moment from another student who was reading Nicholas Sparks. And then, and then, and then uh, Gabriella says, no, 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 no. I don't like that kind of stuff. I like gay literature. No, me gusta gay. Like, you know, and then she starts to explain how she likes gay literature. And I'm confused still. You know, like lesbian, is it sexual? And, you know, in an, in an adolescent context, that might put people off, but, you know, I keep going with it. You know, so you're reading, I'm asking her, do you like reading lesbian literature, gay literature? At this point, by line 21, she's, we're kind of like, okay, we understand each other. It's about, it's about, um, you know, reading that. And then line 26, I start to ask her, who are the writers? And she starts to explain at line 30, that the application Wattpad um, is, allows her to publish, it comes out every week and it allows her to publish her own books and write about them. And I say at line 33, okay, I'd love to know the names of them. And she says at 35 and 36, uh, I don't know. And, and I don't know. And then by that time, the class was ending and moving on. Everybody's getting up and leaving and so on. So I'm sorry you can't hear the audio. I was worried about that, but anyway, I hope that it got, the idea across and the the main point is that later on after this moment i mean you can see that you know we're both struggling she and i are both struggling like i take out I, at this point down here i take out um 
my, my, her, my, my Google Translate with my phone and I write out to her, do you like gay literature and show her the Portuguese translation? She says, yeah. And then we keep going back and forth. And then later at the very end, when she's saying like how she can post books, I had to have a Portuguese, more competent Portuguese speaker um, kind of explain what she was saying. And by the end, I have a decent idea about what went on. And then even beyond that moment, we, we pick this up in the next days. She starts to show me more about the Wattpad. She shows me more stuff on Facebook about her sexuality being marginalized in Brazil, her family depression, which leads to kind of getting her to work with the school counselors and so on just about these, these issues. She's out of school for a little while because of depression and, and so on. But, you know, overall, you know, this was a moment in which I felt like the relationship that was going on between us, despite the linguistic challenges, um, you know, we're able to draw on our individual backgrounds as much as we can, because we're not deeply aligned in terms of our individual linguistic repertoire, but the social environment and, the, and especially the multimodal environment, environment allows us to persevere and push through and really form, I think, a decent relationship. We're still in some contact now, which is nice. Um, on Facebook, even though she's moved on to to uh, new things. So just to conclude, you know, this it's essential for in this case, I was trying to understand all the students in the classroom. It wasn't easy to to understand. I, it was a lot easier for me to work with, you know, the Arabic speaking and the French speaking students because I could speak with them fairly directly and easily, and I have a lot more um, vignettes. But I felt like Gabriella's vignette turned out nicely or experienced on us because we really worked hard to understand each other and push through. And we both were translanguaging um, across all of the, these uh, modalities that we have discussed. And I think we reached a point at which we knew each other decently um, in the short, fairly short amount of time that exists in, a, in an adolescent newcomer program where the goal is to have students come in improve their English and then get into like main mainstream school. And then, you know, just to summarize, I think her own specific story raise, raises important issues about like literacy and interests that, you know, are not recognized in school. I mean, the school is not, um, you know, bringing up gay literature to discuss and the readers that they have in schools like this are mainly like early childhood kind of stuff to whatever, to read about Johnny Appleseed because that's, you know, that's the, the stuff's available for early early literacy activities for, for the most part in the United States. And, you know, and it raises important issues about how, uh, how adolescents are, you know, not seen as fully adult yet. So things like um, discussing gay literature, sexuality make a lot of adults uncomfortable. And, you know, and it leads, unfortunately, I think for students sometimes to feel a bit marginalized or to feel a little bit disconnected from the from the whole school experience. So um, I just conclude to say, I think that this kind of researching multilingual is researching multilingually and this whole volume has been so fun because it's allowed us to talk about it's such a you know rich challenge and opportunity. And it's a pleasure to, to be working with people using our own linguistic repertoires, working with others and being reflective on this whole process. And hopefully through it, through that we can, we can, um, create more equitable worlds and opportunities for people to, um, to live and work together in, um, in a relatively um, peaceful and harmonious experience. So thank you for all, all your attention. I, I don't have a lot of references here, but I hope it illustrates the, um, the goal that I'm going for. Thank you very much, Brian, uh, for your presentation, particularly in uh, translanguaging uh, and all the aspects involved in that. And we already have some questions for both of you for uh, uh, the Theron and uh, John's presentation, as well as for Brian. Let me see there, some of them are kind of overlapping questions. And um, first of all, about translanguaging. So, um, Okay, this is, this is an interesting question and I think either uh, presenters can respond to this. Can we say that translanguaging is an obstacle or give negative effects in learning English as a second language? So what do you guys think about that issue? Um, um, uh, we had a, we gave a similar uh, presentation based on our chapter um, 
earlier this uh, last year, wasn't it, John? It was. Yeah, I think so. And um, one of the people at the conference was a language teacher and said something, asked us a very similar question, which was when students are switching between languages in the classroom, um, what are the implications of that for translanguaging? And um, I'm not sure what Brian would say about this, but I think his vignette shows that translanguaging is very much a uh, bridge in order to help affect communication. So if you don't know how to say what you wanna say in whatever language you're trying to learn, but you do know how to say it in a language that you're not learning at the time, then using the language, whatever, whether it's, a, whether it's a labeled national language, an official language or not, using whatever language you know in order to communicate your intended meaning and then using that as a starting point to negotiate with the person you're trying to talk to to help them understand that is the definition of translanguaging. And I think it's more language teaching catching up to the way people actually communicate in my mind. Like that's the way, if you're in the market and you need to buy something and you don't speak the language that the person selling speaks, you, you use, like my favorite example is one person from Malaysia getting on a bus in Japan and the bus driver needed to tell them, I forget what it was, like you you need to leave your, please do not talk on your cell phone. Or there was something that they needed to tell them. And he flipped this clipboard up and he had written on the clipboard, the instructions for people who didn't speak Japanese. And he pointed to that. And that was a kind of mediation of language. He didn't speak English, they didn't speak Japanese, but having that little thing on the clipboard helped him to communicate the message he wanted to get across. I think I'll stop here. If Brian and John want to follow up, they're welcome to. I would just agree. I, I think that translanguaging, sorry, translanguaging is the natural state of bilingual, bi and multilingual people. If you're teaching English or any other language, any target language in any context, it's your choice is basically, are you going to use that as a resource or see it as a barrier? And I think the people who have historically seen it as a barrier have done a lot of harm. And I think that TESOL and, and many, and, you know, ACTFL and many other organizations are um, just changing quickly to understand that, you know, uh, the, the linguistic repertoire people bring to, the, to any situation is a deep resource. It's the only resource. And if you're not going to really engage with it, you, you know, are doing some things that are deeply problematic. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to echo what Brian has just said and Theron's vignettes as well. I mean, um, I'd like to just raise the point that sometimes when you are in an institutional setting, some institutions have some strict monolingual policies. Um, some universities have a very vague one. My university has a very vague policy, but I work with some colleagues who listen to me talking about how I legitimize the students L1 through translanguaging as kind of, they regard it as not giving the students enough uh, English language speaking practice. So they look negatively in a very, very conservative way at my practice as almost like I'm taking the easy way out. But as I think Brian and Theron have suggested, it's a natural part of uh, social life. I mean, Crease and Blackledge, you know, have done a lot of research into even in, in England, in mono, so-called monolingual societies, how with the ways of immigration in marketplaces, Translanguaging is just a natural way of life. <laughs> so why shouldn't it also become a natural um, way in which we approach classroom practice? That's right. So that's a, a, it's a phenomena where now we appreciate all the linguistic uh, repertoire that we have to uh, communicate as well as for research. So we come to the question now. Um, so for those, I think there's one question from one of our students from Tamara. And she asked, um, so what are the tips that uh, you as an experienced uh, researcher here um, can give about doing research uh, with translanguaging involved in there? Any takers? Um, I'll just say what I'm getting from, I guess what I'm saying is to, how to say it? Translanguaging, you're going to translanguage in your research, no matter what is happening. So I think what um, is coming out of this whole symposium is to be 
um, aware and to be reflective on, you know, what you're trying to achieve. In my own case, you know, I, I, I totally acknowledge that, um, you know, under normal circumstances, I had no right to be doing research with a person like Gabriella. I don't share a lot of her linguistic background and so on, but I mean, I, in, in the broader picture of my project, you know, it, she, it, it, you know, it fits in, in well because there was a lot of other pieces to the puzzle. Uh, that I was looking at, but I think that for many people who are doing really close eth eth ethnographies of you know communities that they share a close thing, uh, linguistic background to, even then, they're like I, we've already heard a few people say that they thought it was going to be easy, but then they discovered that you know you're not quite as much of an insider as you thought, and those um, that's just I think those are sort of two polar opposites. My my experience with Gabriella is maybe one kind of extreme in a sense, and then the other extreme um, or other side and and but they're all fraught with a lot of things that need to be you know reflected on and written through and you know read and I don't think there, there's no answer it's just the process of reflecting and thinking it through is is hopefully leads a person to a, a reasonable uh, position thank you very yeah, much I, yes go I ahead just, John uh, this is Theron but just oh sorry <laughs> I just I just wanted to follow up really quickly and say that um, I, I work when I work with postgraduate students a lot of times they're looking for the right answer to the question they're they're looking for mm -hmm. how do I analyze this data correctly mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that um, the translanguaging research at least John and my experience showed is that um, there isn't necessarily a correct way to analyze a set of data there isn't necessarily a correct way to approach a research project, but one of the important things is to be reflexive about it right from the beginning to say, to acknowledge in order to do any research, I have to make some decisions and to make it explicit what those decisions are that you're making. And to the extent possible, like if you're working on a PhD, you have a project that needs to be finished eventually. You can't just constantly go back and question decisions you made at the beginning of it, or it'll never get through to the end. But as you go along in the process to say, I've made this decision, this is the justification for why I'm approaching it this way. And maybe after the project's finished later on, you can reflect on what are the consequences of the decisions I made. And some of the best reflective work, even in the dissertation itself will say, I made these research decisions and the consequences of these research decisions are X, Y, and Z. And you know, I could have been interested in this, but because I chose to examine this particular phenomenon, I had to kind of, as a consequence, narrow down what my what my focus was. But there's, I mean, when you go through multiple projects, there's always a kind of narrowing down of focus and then there's an opening back up again. I think for John and I, we've done three of these autoethnographic projects now, looking at different aspects of our research practice in each one of them. And every time we kind of narrow down to something and then we open back up again. And then when the next project comes along, the question is, what are we going to narrow down on next? What are we going to look at next? So I think it's better to think about that way rather than saying what is what is a tip or what is one way to, a, what is the correct way to approach a set of data? Right, thank you very much, uh, John, Theron and Brian for sharing your, um, your presentations today. For all the audience, uh, we will continue with the Q&A session. Uh, and so if you have more questions, go ahead and write in the Q&A box. Uh, I will continue with the next presentation. And now we, shifting, we shift to methodological aspect, even though we already talked about methodology in some of the previous presentation. But uh, the next presentation will be on methodological issue. And I would like to welcome my beloved friends, uh, Jion and Jaehyun. They're all already here. They're all my colleague in Indiana University when we were at the doctor program. And I think Jay is uh, finishing up too. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, would like, I would like to uh, introduce them to all the audience and the other presenters. So Jion Park is a university instructor at Korea National Open University. Uh, she graduated from the Department of Literacy, Culture, and Language Education, Indiana University, 
Her research interests are in English as a second or foreign language, academic writing and literacy education in Rwanda. And they uh, and John will be presenting uh, the session with Jay Hyun Im. So Jay um, is a PhD candidate uh, at the university at Indiana University Bloomington. His research interests lie in English teacher identity, hip hop based ed English education, hip hop localization, and discursive psychology. And uh, I know that you guys just published your um, article in, uh, is it in International Applied Linguistic Journal, if I'm not mistaken? Is that right, Jay? Uh, Applied Linguistics Review. Oh, Applied Linguistic Review. Okay, in addition to a doctoral candidate and a researcher, Jay is also a popular DJ in Bloomington. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jay? Um, it's it's a really it's a really nice uh, performance. So every time we have Korea night, uh, Jay will be there and uh, enlighten the you know the activity with uh, all that DJ. So that's really relevant with what what he has done in his writing about hip hop. So um, Jion and Jae Hyun, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sari. My lovely friend. <laughs> and hello, my name is John Park, and my co author and co presenter is here with us today. Please say hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And this is Jay. Yeah, we are very pleased to talk about our book chapter on translingual perspectives, data collection, and analysis in CMC, computer mediated communication context. At the 2020 Southern Reasoner Sumatra Teaching English as a Foreign Language International Research Symposium. Thanks for inviting us. And um, even before this era of COVID-19, CMC scholarship has been growing since the early to mid 1990s. And as the internet changed the way people perceive virtual communication, particularly in online marketplaces, it may work for us as English teachers and teacher educators paying attention to the advancing materials of translingual practices in CMC and in online marketplaces and how the synchronous or asynchronous CMC data could be analyzed from a translingual perspective. So we hope that our book chapter and today's presentation could provide a good resource and helpful tool for international scholars and teachers in language education and CMC research fields, because we will candidly share about our own journey of how we have grown as translingual researchers. And we are going to talk about our data mining process and how we analyze them. Also, finally, we are going to offer an extended model of translingual strategies in CMC context. So, um, so we have two research questions here. So uh, while observing the online market related chat data and this Questions. We noticed the moments of discrepancies of meeting between customer service providers and their counterparts because of their linguistic and cultural differences. So our first research question was, how can we observe and analyze the online market related chat data from translingual perspective? And uh, we try to explain how these communicative glitches among multilingual interlocutors in real-time online communication might be differently interpreted from translingual perspective in CMC context. So why do we need an extended model of translingual strategies in CMC context? Our recent present, well, publication in Applied Linguistics Review may provide more details of the data analysis results, but today we are going to focus more on the process, how we as a researchers did our own uh, process of data mining and uh, ex ex uh, developing the extended model of translingual 
uh, strategies in CMC context. So uh, as an English, as a foreign language learners, learning English in Korea, where there are many English tests throughout the curriculum, our focus and interest usually lie in accuracy and grammaticality. However, since we took translingualism class, um, a graduate, graduate, graduate course, seminar course, our perspective on language has kind of changed. And translingualism lens allowed us to to change our view to be more interested in strategies of multilingual speakers, like how they use uh, their linguistic and cultural resources for interaction. And much research has investigated CMC among speakers of different first languages in both casual and academic contexts. And um, these studies have revealed the characteristics of CMC patterns and linguistic behaviors that are unique to CMC, such as continuum of orality and literacy of CMC, and English for multilingual speakers using online public spaces and social media, and online library reference services were researched. However, little research um, has been explored how multilingual speakers use English in the online marketplaces and how, what strategies they employ to negotiate meaning and achieve successful communication. Let's move on to the next slide. So in online context, uh, English is often regarded as uh, international language or intercultural language and like a complementary service language or bridge language among multiple cultures, or sometimes it is uh, considered negatively as a killer language in the national online context. So it seems like uh, English seems to be a default language while many local languages, including um, Korean that our study will showcase are regarded as minor ones. And we wanna see more dynamic interactions So we collect data from Korean online communities. Um, I just personally have been very interested in street brands like a Supreme, Palace, Nike, Adidas, uh, etc. And one of the communities that I belong to is called Nike Mania. So where people gather together to exchange information. Sometimes those, uh, sometimes the members who are not fluent in English sometimes ask help from other members about their English communication, especially when they have, when they need to talk to English speaking customer agent for, for example, returning their uh, items or tracking their items, et cetera. So being a translingually oriented research, researcher, I found interesting to see how seemingly deviant language in use actually can function properly between speakers from uh, different linguistic and culture backgrounds. All right, so um, we decided to employ Kanagaraja's model and we thought initially this model may fit our data and um, however, the fact that the model is not based on the CMC context, but mostly spoken and written discourses pushed us to think about what is not captured here. So we need to add in order to catch the CMC specific translingual meaning negotiation practices. So when Jayan uh, suggested this collaborative research in the 2018 spring, both of us found the data set seem interesting. And as mentioned above by Jayan, the four meaning negotiation strategies may explain CMC specific aspects well. However, as submitting a manuscript to an academic journal in next year, we received the comments and feedback from the editor in chief and reviewers of the journal. And we learned that the translingual meaning negotiation strategies be extended to better capture the translingual practices in the CMC specific contexts. 
So the data from the online marketplaces used in this study demonstrate the dynamics of Canagra's four key translingual negotiation strategies. However, we had to add one more um, strategy here called as transmodality. I was so glad to hear from Brian's presentation about the multimodality because that's what we focused on from a translingual perspective. And in our uh, study, the transmodality means an ability to do shuttling between different online modes and different online platforms and simultaneously to encode and decode languages, emoticons, and cultures. So in online marketplaces, this type of interaction of commercial transactions becoming increasingly common and the translingualism lens provided a theoretical framework through which we could capture the sophisticated the meaning negotiation strategies, as well as the interlocutor's ability to shuttle between modes and platforms. Could we move on to the next slide? So our CMC data, um, which is online conversation between English speakers and Korean speakers, were analyzed drawing upon methodologically uh, applied conversation analysis and theoretically translingualism. So when, when we said uh, methodologically applied conversation analysis, we mean that uh, we our focus lies on the turn takings. That is how a turn, a sentence or a turn can influence on the, the following sentence and how they make, um, like a, how they harmoniously uh, work together to run their conversation. So we have like, a, as, as, as Jian um, showed, we have five different uh, strategies, but I'd like to focus on one strategy here, recontextualization. So as you see the conversation between Sonny, who is Korean customer who wants to stop subscribing wine delivery and Ashton, who is English speaking customer agent, who is helping her to stop the subscription. Uh, their turns are very interesting. So there are many strategies for meaningful negotiation and conversation. Some of those include transliteration of, of English speakers. So for example, line number nine, Ashton, the English speaker said, gee, kamsa, that kamsa is a transliterated word from Korean word, thank you. So this shows that Ashton is sensitive to the context where he talks to, he was talking to a Korean customer. Another interesting point is since Ashton used emoticon to, to represent smile, their conversation, at the end of their conversation, uh, there's always emoticons to, to see like a smiley faces to express their, their emotions. So this, this strategy allows them to make their former conversation between customer service and customer service agent, uh, customer and customer service agent into a little more casual uh, context so that they can communicate a little freely. And also you can see uh, line number 26, the English speakers use of Korean language, but but this is it's it's kind of interesting because that Ashton's use of Korean sentence is not what Korean speakers usually use. But it doesn't matter for their conversation, as you see following turns. Um, and also the last sentence, Sonny, who is Korean, said, "No, you can Korean." So it's grammatically incorrect, right? It, there's no verb in the sentence but it doesn't matter for them to have con meaningful conversation. So these are the um, kind of strategies that translingualism lens can make, a, can make visible. If we use, if we depend on, for example, um, three circle models where English as a foreign language learners are assumed to depend on English as a native language norms, then it's just full of, uh, 
non-conventional and non-grammatical uh, language in use. But as you see, this is a, a their efforts to make a meaningful conversation and to make their co uh, their conversation run smoothly. Thank you, Jihyun. And um, this will be the uh, last um, meaning negotiation strategy we added to the model. And it was called a transmodality. And um, transmodality is a CMC specific strategy, as we mentioned before. And um, as seen from the data presented above, the CMC speakers encode their spoken into written language while referring to such aids on, as online translators, such as Google Translator, and moreover expressing emotions in CMC as shown in the data. And um, they convert their language from their first language to their second language, and also from their second language to first language by using translation and transliteration and moving between spoken and written languages fluidly. And then um, they make use of their first language culture into second language culture and also expanded their ability into the CMC culture. And we could observe how speakers use their own language and uh, use the online translator and uh, use English to make the meaning um, negotiation. And also we found that um, individuals are no longer make their judgments only by themselves, but they consult their community or collective knowledge from online communities. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, thus we suggest expanding the idea of translanguaging, aspiring our uh, translingual researchers to better interpret and explain the languages and cultures, cultural norms of multi and translingual practices, particularly in CMC system. So this view allowed us to think of what is going on and how languages are used in order for speakers to reach their communication goals. So throughout the paper and our book chapter, I mean, because of the time limit and um, due to the space limit, we weren't able to put every single detail here. But throughout the presentation, we kind of aim to uh, showcase that uh, translingualism lens uh, allow us to see more details and how strategies for mean, uh, meaningful negotiation are employed and how are they are negotiated uh, at, the, at, the, at the center of interaction. So for future studies, uh, we suggest observation data that make translingual practices, practices visible by using video recording and eye tracking and mobile computer screenshot or activities in online communities. And uh, also we recommend to conduct more studies on mobile platforms that embody different communicative techniques from CMC. And um, we hope that we can answer two further questions in our future studies, like how does meaning negotiation take place between speakers from di different backgrounds and what strategies are used and how they work to make their conversation long. And these are some key references of our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John and Jay, uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm sure there will be some questions about that, but um, I would like to move to the next presentation. Uh, two more presentations that we have, and then we will have another Q&A session. Um, I would like to welcome also my dear colleague, um, at the doctor program, as well as back in Indonesia, um, Dr. Mateus Yumarnanto. Welcome, Pak Mateus. 
Yeah, thank you, Vatsari. So thank you. Okay, I will um, introduce uh, Dr. Yumar Namto to all of us here. So Pak Mateus received his PhD from Indiana University Bloomington. He is currently a Vice Dean of Academic Affairs at Widya Mandala Surabaya Catholic University. His interests include language teacher professional identity, teacher's narrative, curriculum and education policy, and metaphors in applied linguistics. So today, um, Dr. Yumar Namto will share uh, the presentation about transcribing and translating multilingual data. But Mateus, the Zoom floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Batsari and uh, Beth, that uh, have become our editors for the upcoming book. And uh, in uh, the book chapter yeah, that I wrote, uh, I don't want to raise the issue in methodology, but actually this is a kind of uh, my journey in writing my dissertations. So it is about my feeling. It is about what I think when I'm transcribing, when I was transcribing and translating the multilingual data. So for Indonesian participants, I, I believe you are very familiar with the story of Malin Kunda. But for international audience, uh, uh, probably you, we, we need to understand about the story. So if you take a look at uh, the picture here, so uh, you can see here, uh, this is a stone that looks like a human being and the stone uh, is located in a uh, beach in Padang. Uh, so uh, people believe that this is the stone of Marin Kundang, uh, which has been cursed by his mother. Why that happened? Yeah. So uh, basically Marin Kundang was a boy, was, uh, was born in a small village and uh, he raised by his mother. And uh, as a small boy, as a uh, uh, poor boy, he wanted to become successful. So he traveled, uh, he, he left his village and traveled and finally become uh, an international trader. And the story is quite famous, not only in Indonesia, but also in Southeast Asia. This is the story about uh, the ungrateful son. Yeah, the ungrateful son. So the ungrateful sons uh, was become, uh, yeah, the Marin Kundang uh, was become uh, Malin Kundang became a successful businessman. Uh, he had a lot of ships trading in Southeast Asia and when he returned to his village, yeah, he, he was a famous man. And uh, his mother, still poor, still living in the village, still yeah, uh, with uh, her her uh, neighborhood, she wanted to meet Malin Kundang, but Malin Kundang, uh, as a successful, uh, successful businessman, married a uh, queen, he refused his mother. So that's why he was cursed to become a stone. Yeah, to become a stone, a crying stone. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, for transcribing and translating. So in my experience um, as a researcher, I'm, I was doing my dissertation research at that time. And my dissertation research was um, uh, related to teacher professional identity. Later on, I will show you. Uh, but the relationship between the story is that translating and uh, transcribing is a kind of betrayal. So this is my thesis uh, in working in the uh, book chapter. So uh, it is betraying our own culture. So this is the perspective from Indonesians uh, that I went to Indiana University working on my dissertation and completing my dissertation in 2016. Let's see here. So uh, 
recall 2006 uh, sets about this, that when we are transcribing, actually we are serving to masters. Yeah, so in the case here, uh, I have multilingual data, uh, Indonesians, and I need to translate that into English so that it can be understandable to international audience, to English speaking uh, academicians and researchers. If not, then uh, my research will not go nowhere. So uh, that's why it is served to masters. So the powerful masters, the English speaking masters. And I also serves yeah my own culture indonesians in this case so that's why uh, i believe what uh, ricard said here to translate he says is to serve to master the foreigner with his work the reader with his desire for appropriations foreign author reader dwelling in the same language as the translator indeed this is this paradox falls within the domain of an unparalleled problematic doubly sanctioned by a foe of faithfulness and suspicions of betrayal. So um, in the chapter, the act of transcribing and translating multilingual data, yeah, uh, we believe it is part of uh, part and parcel of the standard research procedure so that it can be accepted by international audience. Yeah. So this is uh, a practice, academic practice that we can accept basically, but uh, we need to be critical toward this one. So I would like to give context uh, to this in Indonesia because in Indonesia, as professor, we need to write and uh, we need to publish in a journal publications. And the journal publication that is written in English is uh, what's more than uh, if it is written in Indonesian. Why? Because uh, it will reach international audience. When the articles written in Indonesian, it just yeah for Indonesians yeah so uh, international audience will not understand uh, about the research so uh, that's why uh, it is a big issue when at that time I tried to translate and to transcribe what I felt at that time doing that is a kind of uh, betraying my own culture. I'm interviewing Indonesians for my dissertation data. And uh, some of them speak English, some of them speak Indonesians. And the data, uh, the Indonesian language, I need to translate. I need to trans transcribe and to translate in order to uh, re uh, later on get published for international audience. So uh, for me, this is a kind of tensions yeah, uh, in my uh, in my side. So uh, in one side, I need to uh, make an effort to be accepted into the international academia, international community of researchers. In other sides, yeah. Uh, most since uh, mostly it is in English, then uh, the P Indonesian people, which uh, cannot speak English, cannot read English, will never get the idea about the research. Okay, so this is a kind of tensions, and uh, uh, the tensions keeps going during the process of my uh, dis dissertations. Yeah. So my dissertation is this, yeah. Indonesian English language teachers, professional growth and changing identities, also ethnography and narrative inquiry. That's the title of my dissertation. So uh, in the part of our auto ethnography, I, uh, I was telling about myself as a teacher, as an English teacher, uh, as an English teacher, uh, I was born also in a village. Uh, my English was not good. 
uh, once when I was in middle school, my English teacher said, you have a kasafa tang. Kasafa tang in Indonesian means, yeah, uh, you cannot speak English at all. Your pronunciation, your intonation cannot be understood because you eat kasafa every day. Yeah. Uh, kasafa uh, has a kind of stigma that only poor people eat it. Yeah, cassava. So that's why my teacher said you have a cassava tongue. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from there, then, uh, yeah, uh, this is the process. Uh, and finally, I'm working on these dissertations. And uh, for the narrative inquiry, I interviewed English teachers uh, who were at that time uh, uh, studied in the US, in the two uh, uh, universities in the Midwest. So that's why, once again, I interviewed them. Uh, uh, at first, I plan to have interview in English only. Why? Because I don't want to deal with the translations and so on. But uh, in fact, my participants at that time said, I don't want to be interviewed in English. I want to be interviewed in Indonesian because we are Indonesians. Uh, when we talk uh, as Indonesians, it is not uh, feel comfortable uh, to speak in English because you are Indonesians and I'm Indonesian. So yeah, uh, I accommodate this uh, request. So uh, in some cases, uh, in, uh, for some participants, uh, for my dissertations, I interviewed them in Indonesians. And as we know, uh, even in Indonesians, uh, we have different culture. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, we have more than, I think, 500 uh, indigenous languages and Indonesian spoken by different people from different areas in Indonesia may slightly different because of the cultural background and because of the indigenous languages. So that's why although uh, some are in Indonesian and I'm familiar with Indonesian because I'm Indonesian, I also should deal with the diversity of cultures even uh, from Indonesian's uh, perspective. So these are the challenges that I face uh, dealing with the trans transcribing and translating the multilingual data. So uh, I'm not English native speaker. So when I translate that, I should be very careful. I consult native speakers, uh, whether the, uh, the language, the grammar and so on is correct. So uh, because I'm not native English speakers. Yeah. And then uh, multicultural competence once again, because all to the participants are Indonesian. They, uh, they come from uh, different areas in Indonesia. They have different cultures, yeah. have different cultures. Yeah. And then once again, I need to serve two masters, once English speaking audience and the other uh, Indonesians, yeah. Indonesians audience that have uh, that we uh, share cultures with with me. Yeah. Uh, that's why it is once again this is kind of uh, conclusions. My conclusions that the act of translating is kind of betrayals. Yeah, like Marin Kundang who denied his own roots to gain a new cosmopolitan identity. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was as a uh, as a researcher trying to uh, finishing my PhD dissertations, uh, try to gain the cosmopolitan identity, try, try to get accepted as the members of the international community, researchers, member of uh, community of researchers. To do that, there is no other way. I need to translate that into English. Okay, so uh, this is the betrayal because actually if uh, I present my research in Indonesian, the Indonesian people will get benefit from uh, the findings because the findings basically is uh, related uh, closely to Indonesian culture and Indonesian's audience. But I need to translate that into English so that I got accepted as members of international researchers community. 
Yeah. So uh, once again, this is yeah. Uh, I likened myself as Malin Kundang in the way that he betrayed his own culture. He was rejected. Uh, he betrayed his own culture by embracing the international cosmopolitan culture by embracing the perspective of. Uh, in this case, I can say Western perspective in looking at things and looking at the reality, looking at uh, what is it about of becoming researchers and so on. And it may not get easily accepted by the traditional culture, yeah, traditional culture, yeah. Uh, but unlike Malin Kundang, uh, I have to make peace with the two masters. So uh, I think uh, it is a reasonable decision that I made peace with both. With both. So I need to be uh, an international researcher as well as national researchers. I need to serve both masters yeah, to be accepted both internationally and to be accepted in the, uh, as, yeah, and still to embrace my own identity as Indonesian. Okay, so um, I don't want to go to the detail how I translate and how I transcribe the data later on when the book uh, is published, then uh, I hope the audience can read it and uh, how I struggle in, uh, uh, in serving the two masters. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thanks for being here. And later on, we will have more discussion. Thank you, Mbak Sari. And, thank you uh, very and, much. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Mateus, for sharing your experience um, in doing research multilingually. Um, we will have question and answers, but um, I'm going to uh, welcome Dr. Fatma Said our last presenter today. Do we have Padma? We have one more presenter, and I think she said she's already in. Um, let's see, I don't see her name in here. Uh, please, the committee, if you see Dr. Fatma Said's name, maybe you can add her. Oh, Fatma is here. Um, let's see if I can see it in my gallery view. Okay, there she is there. All right. Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, Fatma. <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm glad you make it. I was scared, thinking, "Oh my God, I'm in, but nobody can hear me." <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can hear you very clear. I'm glad okay. I was. I was unable to see your name on the uh, on the screen, so I thought maybe you were accessing from the participants' uh, Zoom. But yeah, I'm glad that you are already here. Uh, before you begin your presentation, I would like to introduce you to all our participants today. So Dr. Fatma Said is an assistant professor at Zayed University at United Arab uh, Emirates. And also she is a researcher at the University of York, United Kingdom. Her research is centered within social linguistics and applied linguistics and primarily focuses on bilingualism of Arabic English speaking children and their families. She's, she also has an interest in how current research methodologies can be enhanced to support multilingual data collection, management and analysis. Uh, Fatma is also an editorial board member of Multilingua and a reviewer for peer review journal and various funding bodies. Um, Dr. Fatma Said, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'll just um, share the screen for the presentation. I wonder if you can see it. Yes, we can see it really well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'll uh, thank you for the nice introduction, actually. <laughs> so that uh, answered many of the things I was going to talk about. Um, so the focus really of this chapter and of the talk is to do with the challenges that students and researchers working with multilingual data have when it comes to presenting the data. 
how do I do this data, how do I present the data, um, and what the possible solutions could be um, for that. So, obviously we know as the wonderful talks have previously in this session um, outlined that multilingualism is the norm, translanguaging is normal, uh, code switching, all these things, the fact that um, multilingual speakers use more than one code to communicate their meanings is normal, there's nothing abnormal about it. Um, and I think fields like TESOL and um, other fields of education are coming to realize this. Um, so with that, there's also obviously been a shift in scholarship or should I say maybe more space has been made in the sense that the number of researchers working with multilingual data is increasing. So uh, for example, um, PhD students I work, I work with come with many languages. Sometimes they research those languages. Um, but the problem is that the current research methods that we have in place that guide students, that we use when we're training students, are largely monolingual in nature. And so obviously this pose poses a problem. How do I present the data? Um, maybe my language is in a different script. I don't really have software that can help me analyze my language in its own script. So this can be um, really challenging sometimes because students don't really um, then know what to choose uh, in how to present the data. And so it becomes a really complex task once you've collected multilingual data. It's obviously time consuming. Uh, as a student, I was always unsure of the transcription conventions. What do I do? And then obviously you have the added complexity of the actual data analysis. Whereas people working with monolingual data, all they have to do is data analysis and transcription. But with the transcription uh, in English, for example, we have transcription software in English. So that it means you can take your audio, data that you've collected in English, put it in this software, the software transcribes everything for you, plus all the pauses, plus all the exclamations, plus all the intonations, and then all the researcher then has to do is edit it slightly, which is also time consuming, but then do the actual data analysis. Whereas when you're working with um, multilingual data, the first thing you have to do is translation. Right, let me translate it. Do I translate all of it? And then, is it, how do I translate this? And then transcribe it. Do I transcribe all of it? And then to what extent? And then the analysis. So in the book chapter um, that uh, obviously um, Beth and Sari <laughs> have been working with us so tirely, tirelessly for uh, the last long months, um, one of the comments I make or one of the things I say is that there needs to be some kind of recognition that students who work with multilingual data should be recognized somehow in the PhD, either by having an extension because they have to work with this complex data or some kind of remark in their PhD as a recognition that they have had to do nearly double the work that their monolingual counterparts had to do in within the same time and within the same requirements. And I think that all goes to, that all obviously speaks to um, a shift in research. Multilingualism is the norm, there is an increasing number of students working with multilingual data, not just in my field of linguistics, but in other fields. But the task is complex, and so the field needs to shift to make space for multilingual researchers in a number of ways. My own multilingual research data, or my own multilingual research journey, should I say, was that I became highly reflective or reflexive. I was constantly thinking, right, what do I need to do to answer the questions? Okay, I need to transcribe, I need to translate, I need to do this. But how do I present the data? Um, how do I ensure it's rigorous? How do, how do I ensure that it's strong enough and that this data would be taken seriously, for example? Is there a way to establish uniformity across my work? How do I ensure that everything I publish looks the same? Do I need to come up with my own conventions? And so obviously in the end I came up with my own conventions and I made a key for how people could read my data. And this has helped me a lot in publishing book chapters, in publishing papers in journals, uh, and, and so on. So the consistency became really important for me, but also that constant reflection of, you know, the data I work with is Arabic data. I speak Arabic. How do I present this data for non-Arabic speakers? And um, the wonderful speaker, actually, just before me spoke about this business of how do you serve like two different audiences with your data? Because on the one hand, you have people who speak Arabic who will also be reading how you've transcribed, translated, and treated this data. Then you have people who don't know any Arabic. 
and how they're going to be reading this. How do you get them to understand why this part of language use was important to you? How do you get them to pay attention to those kinds of things? Um, and to also appreciate it in a scholarly way, like, okay, this makes sense, okay, this doesn't make sense, um, and so on. Um, and so this reflexive uh, approach that I adopted um, it was obviously inspired by, or partly inspired by, um, Atir and Edge in their 2017 work on reflexivity in multilingual research. And they talk about this idea of this continuous growth or this continuing growth of the whole person who researches as integral uh, a person who researches as integral to the process of research. So the researcher, the multilingual researcher, views themselves as part of the research process and as part of this data and as part of the whole uh, uh, process of meaning making from the beginning to the end. The researcher is integral and central to um, the um, process of presenting data. And so you're constantly reflecting and you're constantly thinking about how is it going to be presented? Is the meaning correct? Because Aside from, oh my God, this is uh, multilingual data, how do, I, how do I present it? There's always this nagging thing of, is it correct? Does it make sense? Is it scholarly? So this is a great approach and this helped me a lot. And then there are certain questions I always ask myself. How can I balance my time and find extra periods in which to translate non-English data? Um, and I know as a PhD student, I needed something like... Um, Altogether, if I count altogether, maybe something like eight months. Eight months for translation and transcribing. Um, obviously, this wasn't continuous eight months, but in between everything um, to get this done. To what detail do I transcribe the data? Do I transcribe everything? And obviously, this goes back to your research question. What's, your, what's the research question? Are you interested in specific parts of language or is it everything? For my research, it was everything because I'm looking for interaction patterns, um, my research lies in um, how bilingual children who grow up speaking English and Arabic master both of their languages. So I look at how language is used within the home. How much do parents speak? How much do children speak? What type of styles are they speaking in? Is it code switching? Is it translanguaging? Is it mixing? Is it English? Is it only Arabic? And then Arabic obviously has its own um, uh, uh, different, uh, unique nature, should I say where Arabic is diglossic. This means that there are two parts of Arabic. We have oh, a couple of Arabics, if you like. We have Quranic Arabic. We have uh, what we call Fusha, which is um, classical Arabic. Then we have standard Arabic or modern standard Arabic. This is what you'd see if you watch the news in Arabic. Then we have spoken Arabic, and that has various versions as well. So the challenge for parents is which Arabics should we use, which Arabics, you know. And so you see all of this coming up in the data. And so for me, I had to transcribe everything. And then it's like, how do I translate this? How do I then communicate to the audience the importance of all this translanguaging and all this language mixing that's happening? How should I present the data? Do I translate? Do I transcribe? Do I show the grammatical aspects of this data? Because sometimes, even within Arabic, just the choice of which words to use is significant for the speaker. How do I then show my audience that grammatically this is a play on a particular word in Arabic? How does it make sense to, to the audience? And so I had to navigate all of this. And it was a really good um, experience for me because then it, 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 it equipped me to be able to, one, present the PhD, then obviously publish, and then obviously now supervise my own students who work in various languages. And I always ask them these questions of, once you've got your data, these are the things you need to always ask yourself. Go back to the research question, think about how much data you need to transcribe, how will you present this data so we can respect the language and how it's being used. Um, and then obviously this whole idea of how do, I, how do I highlight the important parts of the data, especially in Arabic. How can I tell my audience that, well actually, they were speaking spoken Arabic, but then he switched to classical Arabic to make a point. How do I highlight this and how would my transcription conventions be able to do this? And then finally, um, what constitutes language boundaries? So I know we've spoken about translanguaging and code switching and all these things, but um, obviously it's still really important, even in translanguaging, to know that there is a movement between the codes. Um, and so, for example, the, the example I've given you here is the word mama, uh, meaning mother, obviously. And I kept asking myself, is it Arabic, is it in English, or do I count it as neutral? Because I was doing this whole... A demarcation of language. How much Arabic are they using? How much English are they using? And obviously the word mama 
in any case they could never they never called their mother mum it was always mama then i asked myself but is it arabic but is it english so in the end i went uh, i made a uh, important um, methodological decision and i decided to treat the word mama as neutral so i didn't count it towards arabic because you can imagine how many times children call their mother if i had counted mama as an arabic word it would have shown that they use a lot of arabic which wasn't necessarily true so i made the decision that actually mama would only be a neutral word like baba would be a neutral word and any of the uh, all their names also would be neutral because these are the way they are whether they're speaking english or arabic they constantly use this word mama to obviously mean my mother um and so you come to a point where you make these methodological decisions and you have to be consistent in how you're continuing to do that you have to be creative and innovative you have to think outside the box you have you're constantly pushed the other thing that helped me a lot was con extensive research of what others have already presented these are arabic uh, scholars working with arabic this is what they've presented is that what i want to present oh that's really simple that's really complicated right so how do i ensure that it suits my data what were their aims how did their aims affect their decisions hmm okay what are my what are my aims how do how do my aims affect my decisions do i translate everything do i transcribe everything do i offer the grammatical uh, analysis of the words would that have helped me so for the so you have to obviously work outside your comfort zone uh, for a long time so this is what what i'm saying that the field of research has to shift to accommodate for multilingual researchers because all of these qualities all of these exercises as a researcher that i had to go through and that some of my students are now going through in their phd requires a lot of time in addition to the already uh, pre prescribed process of research the thing i would say to students or in general the things i've learned is you have to find your own space ensure you've answered the question clearly so what's your question my question is always what are parental ideologies what pract what language practices do parents use in the home to help their children foster bilingualism or learn arabic my transcript my transcription and my data should be able to answer that question and so in the path of answering that question you should be able to make clear decisions in how your transcription will um, and your translation will uh, will um, one answer the question but two also be palatable to the audience or be clear to the audience make connections between your decisions and findings be reflexive in methodology talk about the decisions that you've made in regards to your data make it specific to your data and context of your field of research so there's no one way of doing it and i think some of the researchers previously have said this there's no one way of doing it you can't say well i have this data how do i present it everything is context specific for you the researcher for the audience who will be reading this for the people for the uh, language data that you've collected everything is context specific you need to be consistent across your work in data uh, presentation and transcription conventions so for example uh, the way i presented my work in the phd is the same way i present it in book chapters is the same way i present it in journal papers and then i number and code everything so that anybody reading across my work will have this consistency and they will understand the conventions of how i have ad adapted and adopted the already available conventions to make my work unique and obviously accessible and it has to be accessible to um, other researchers and so these are the main um, things i think that are quite important when it comes to um, presenting multilingual research it's challenging but the researcher has to be reflexive and reflective um, and they have to take into account their uh, audience but more importantly their research questions the context of uh, the research that they've collected and also the nature of what they want to put forward to uh, readers and to people who would appreciate um, their, 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 their data. The one thing that always guides me is I always say I have to respect the language. I, have, I must respect the language I'm working with. Is there anything unique in this language that needs to be presented so that people can appreciate the creativity taking place or the nature of this language? as long as i can do that then everything else uh, fits in to how i want the data to be presented so it's complicated it's complex but it's not impossible and i will say again that there, there definitely needs to be a shift in the research world if you like to make space for multilingual researchers because of the time consuming issues um, 
that come with it. Uh, for somebody like myself who works with Arabic, I initially started collecting my data in Arabic and writing in Arabic script. When it came to the analysis, I realized, oh my God, I can't put this into Envivo. I can't put this into any of these already predefined softwares that would have helped me to code and highlight and everything else. And so then I had to transliterate it into Roman letters, which obviously is normal. But that takes double the time because there is no software to help. So as a researcher, you kind of have to come up with um, uh, ways of supporting yourself in how you deal and how you uh, uh, analyze the data. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to make this a kind of uh, overview, but also like a, a tip to share the challenges I had, but also how I overcame these. And I hope that this is helpful to the students in the audience and to uh, researchers as well. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Fatma, for sharing your experience dealing with data, um, multilingual data, um, specifically from Arabic language. And I think you also work with other different languages, right? Um, yes. This is just some of the example. I think in your chapter, you talk about uh, other languages that your participants use. Um, yes, yeah, Arabic, English, and um, Swahili. Mm -hmm. um, but Arabic and Swahili, I mean, English and Swahili, are, you know, we, we can present them in Roman, uh, sorry, in uh, English or uh, alphabets. With Arabic, obviously, it's a challenge, especially spoken Arabic. Um, sometimes there's a way of, uh, of speaking that really is fully appreciated in the Arabic script. So the challenge is always, how do I bring it to English and get the audience to share my excitement in the data as well? And you also deal with different uh, languages in Arabic too, right? The yes, Quranic, yeah, varieties. Uh, mm -hmm. the varieties in, in Arabic that uh, the participants might also use uh, yes. when they communicate. So there's a, such a complex work. Mm -hmm. And I believe all of us here doing uh, research with multilingual data also face these challenges. And it's, it's just nice to hear everyone um, be mindful um, of the processes and just make it visible to others because I think a lot of this complex work is not that visible you know people read our work and just look at all the results but all of the other discussion and work uh, the complex processes as kind of in the background so with this book we're trying to make all of these complex uh, aspects are visible to our readers okay we have some questions uh, from the audience. And um, since this is the last session of the presentation, I think we'll just combine. So any questions relevant to the speakers, I think you can jump in and uh, answer the questions. Um, let me see, there are some of my uh, students and also some audience here are inter interested in the process of uh, of the ethnographic research. I think most of us are coming from this perspective somehow in our work that's representing the engagement with ethnography. And um, there's one question about uh, one of the earlier question from my colleague, uh, Ismail Petrus about um, so what are your personal contact strategies to get close to or to get trust from the participants? Uh, I think that's that's the first one. I think we can address that question first and then we move on to other aspects. Um, anybody would like to take this question? I think it's, it's, it's general enough. Anyone who would be interested in sharing their experience? Yes, I would like to share something mm -hmm. about uh, fostering trust. Um, I work with, uh, obviously, like I said, mainly Arabic speaking um, families. And with um, Arabic families or Arab families, um, they are very conservative, as we know. Uh, many of the women they cover, they wear a hijab like myself. And so coming within the home to record is a real challenge. And sometimes they don't want to take part because they're not sure what you will record and so on. So I started my research wanting to video record everything that happens in the home. And then I agreed with the participants, I will only audio record. So when I made changes to my methodological uh, decisions, I felt that they trusted me. Um, and then the other thing I did was I recruited the mothers to be the recorders. 
So I said to them, anytime you feel like you want to, please record any conversation that's taking place between you and your children. Um, and they did that, and I trusted them. And then I said, and please email me this recording when it's done. So the ones who could, they did that. The ones who couldn't, I would go to their home and download the recording onto my laptop. When this relationship started, there was a trust fostered. So they trusted I only was interested in their conversations, and I trusted they would send me the data. And so that created a lot of trust. And then, as you know, people talk about researchers. Um, once the word got around that this researcher does such and such, I found it easier to recruit other families for follow-up projects. So I think on both sides, if you can show you trust them, they will, they will trust you. Right, so trust is a very important issue as qualitative researcher. And especially when we go to the community, even though I think, I think uh, um, one of, uh, so we have Artanti here. She's also one of the author in our book. Uh, she's also um, attending our webinar now, also uh, having this similar issue about uh, positionality of our, uh, of uh, our positionality within the community. So, so even though we are, we are um, researching the community who, uh, who share similar cultural background, there's still some tension, like Fatma said, there need to be a rapid building still with this community. And I, I can imagine that would be even more challenging with other community. I know Michelle also work with, you know, different um, culture. And so also getting into the uh, community is, um, is a very important, we have, we have to have some very important consideration to uh, get the trust from them. And there's also one question from a student uh, dealing with children. So this is from Erna. Uh, in doing your study, do you have any trouble when you do some interview with students? Special strategy that um, you know that you do that work. So anybody who works with children here? Um, <clears throat> so Brian works with adolescent, right? with youth. Is there any specific yeah. or any, yeah. Uh, I can say something about, um, about Rwanda. It oh appear, yeah. It doesn't appear in the book, but we, um, <clears throat> we interview children and ask them about their reading preferences, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, one of the things that has worked has been to ask them to tell us stories so, so we, we listen to their recounts of things that they've read um, and also things that they have heard. So because the, because the oral storytelling um, practice, the practices of oral storytelling are so strong um, in the community, the children will often listen to stories uh, and also maybe read, but when, they, when we ask them to tell us what have you been reading? Sometimes the oral stories also appear and we know they're oral stories because the, 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 the main characters and they might be like the, the trickster, the trickster is a rabbit, um, does things that no, um, no adult would put into a children's story. Um, but we don't, we don't say, oh, wait, no, no, no. You have to tell us about what you read, not what you, not the story you heard, right? We don't, we don't do that. We, we, we just listen to all of them because this this oral literate divide is uh, is really problematic. I mean, and it's it's similar to I think the the divisions that we've created around. Well, you have to be monolingual when you have to speak monolingually if you're going to learn a language, right? Or you, you have to talk about what you read if you're going to we're, we're going to improve your reading, right? And we want to hear what you what you were what you were listening to as well. So it really opens the children up. Um, a lot of them are, are really happy to tell us tell us the, the stories of, of things that they've been reading or listening to, or or stories that they've told themselves. So. Right. Yeah. So, I think Beth's uh, uh, work on that uh, is available in Tissot Journal, right, Beth? Uh, about storytelling. Uh, a little so bit of anyone, it. A little bit of it. Anyone interested in that? Uh, you can check out uh, that article. I think also about that. Um, 
So Brian, were you about to say something about uh, about the interview? Sure. I mean, I think the um, the question, just in general, and working with adolescents um, is. I don't know. I've, I guess my own experience with working with adolescents and in interviews is just it takes like like time, a lot of time to build trust with adolescents. You know, they're it's not like they're naturally distrustful, but it's just you know there's many many things going on for adolescents in um, you know in getting to know them, their trust about you. Who are you? Are you just another teacher? Are you a member of the administration? Are you uh, you know what are you doing? And I think it you know, those things are all really like complicated to make visible to students because honestly speaking, sometimes they're kind of conflicted, you know, in my own case, you know, I was playing a role as a researcher, but I was trying to support the teachers. I was trying to, um, you know, be kind of a bridge to like a refugee and other migrant support agency. So like a lot of things going there, but I think the, the overall thing with any kind of interview situations to be patient and to be reflexive on things and then yeah do your best to be listening kind of like what beth was saying about um just you know listen to the stories have have a few leading questions or just some general things in your mind that you're interested in and then see where it can go and keep following it um, and never be judgy about what people are saying okay. There's, uh, there's, there are questions, some questions about translanguaging. Um, I'll see that you can start from this one thing. So uh, maybe John and Jay and Mateus can address this question. So how to di differentiate code, code meshing, code mixing, crossing and translanguaging, and how do you analyze the data in terms of, your tran in terms of the translanguaging in your research? Gion and Jay, do you want to start? Um, I guess that's a really huge question. It's kind of hard to answer in a short period, but um, I guess translanguage or translingualism is more like a theoretical lens to understand the 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 how people how people use their linguistic and cultural resources. Whereas co-meshing is one of the strategies that um, translanguaging speakers can employ. And uh, co-meshing is often used, this is a term that is often used in um, academic writing by usually African-American uh, scholars. For example, uh, Young. Mm, what else? Um, and crossing, uh, I'm not sure where it comes from, but usually pretty crossing- Pretty general, right? It sounds pretty it, general. I guess it all, always entails localization of the languages. So for example, crossing, the term crossing is often used in the field of hip hop research. So hip hop crossing means uh, moving uh, linguistic sources or repertoire from the original context uh, here in the States to, for example, Korea, so that uh, Korean rappers can use them to express their own voices. So in that sense, um, co-meshing and crossing is like a two different areas. Can, can I add something as well? Uh, Cause I, I tell my students, look, your decisions about analysis, so data collection, data preparation, and also data analysis, always go back to your research questions. So um, I, I, I'm thinking about a dissertation that was defended this summer that um, uh, looked at um, Arabic, uh, Arabic speaking women, but um, and Muslim women from all over the Arabic speaking world coming together and having these, these salons and talking and, um, and, and, and translanguaging and, and, and how, do you, how do you analyze that data? Um, it was a very complex question, but, but, this, but the student had to continually go back to her, her research questions because the questions, if they're well designed, will lead you to the way that you, like the level of detail that you need to put into the transcript, how you organize the transcript, and then how you analyze it. Um, so and so it, it's 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 difficult to say because there is no one way, as some of some of us have been, you know, other presenters have said, there is no one 
set way to do this. Um, but the questions that you pose to your data will, will guide you to the decisions that you need to make. Okay. Um, there's also... Uh, sorry? Well, can I add one thing? Yes, yes, Jian. Yes, please. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to add that the perspective of per, uh, translating trans languaging is different from other code switching or code masking is the concept of removing the idea of separatist perspective among languages and between languages. So um, the term itself, the trans languaging gives more um, equitable equality to all languages. Um, and uh, it's out of uh, the colonial idea of certain language as um, dominant other languages. So I think translanguaging has um, this um, removal of separatist orientations from its uh, term itself. And that's why now language educators are going for this idea. Thank you, Gion. Uh, do we still have Matthias here? Uh, I don't know if, if we lose him. Um, well, I guess we can have one more question about, I think this is a concern from uh, many of us here in EFL field. So, um, there's one question thing here. How important is accent in translanguaging? Um, especially when the school have very strict rule of using monolingual for instruction. So I know this is more, I uh, think teachers here concerned about that. Um, you know, just uh, when they teach, they want to, um, you know, they talk about competence and the performance. Um, any, any comments from, the presenter about this? So we talk about translanguaging in the data and this is more about translanguaging in terms of uh, learning English. Um, I, I think one thing I can say is whenever you're looking at um, if you're looking at this from a research perspective, whenever you're looking at any data, as um, I think Fatma was explaining, you want to consider what are the communication implications of what you're analyzing. So if you're if you're dealing if this is about dealing with data and analyzing data, the question you might ask is how does how does the accent influence the communication? So you can imagine if somebody's speaking very heavily accented language, whatever that language might be, to another interlocutor and that other interlocutor ends up raising accent as an issue in the conversation, then that certainly could be data that's worth examining. Um, if the perspective is coming from language teaching and issues of accent in language teaching, that I think connects to issues of native speakerism, which are kind of out of the realm of what we were trying to analyze. And I think those native speakerist perspectives are largely what the term translanguaging is trying to respond to. Their translanguaging is trying to move out of a paradigm where you see people as, well, this is a native speaker, this is not a native speaker. And you're trying to label people as, as a kind of identity label to using translanguaging as a verb to talk about moving between languages as a verb rather than an identity marker, which is I think where John and I picked up um, the, one of the concepts that John and I picked up from the translanguaging literature in our chapter, talking about moving between languages as a activity rather than as an expression of identity. That's not to say that the language you choose and how you speak doesn't end up reflecting your identity somehow, but what that's saying is from a translanguaging perspective, you're not starting from a point of identity, you're starting from a point of what 
the languages and the data. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Theron. Um, I'd yeah. just like to um, add what, the Theron, what Theron just said, which is obviously um, really useful. Um, but I think on the, I think the, the, the issue with translanguaging, the issue of multilingualism is that there's two realities. There's the reality of where we live, which is where we appreciate this and we make space for it and we recognize it as normal. Then there's a real space which is on the ground, in the classroom, in the homes, where teachers don't want the mixing of languages, where parents discourage their children from speaking their home languages. And there is a push for English because obviously English is a global language. So there's improve your accent, don't mix because you won't be able to learn the language and so on. And so that's why some research that's come out to show that teachers who actually use their first language to teach English as a second language, the students do better grammatically, social pragmatically. They do better in so many ways because they didn't have this disconnect between their first language and the second language. Um, and then now there's all this talk about, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, making space in uh, university classrooms for translanguaging. For example, I work in uh, the UAE, as you said, and here we teach in English. This is a medium of instruction, but the university I work in is a bilingual university, which means that we can also use Arabic in the classroom. So when I'm teaching linguistic um, ide ideas, I usually teach I would say 95% in Arabic, but there is always the 5% or the small percentage I make room for students to use Arabic. And I find that when I let them use Arabic, and this is a research I'm actually doing now, when they're using some Arabic and when I explain it back to them in Arabic, they do so much better in the next session because they understand what Chomsky was trying to say. They understand what behaviorism is. They understand how children acquire language because at least I've made some space for them to do some translanguaging. But in the real world, it's really hard when teachers have to teach their students English. Then they have to go for these tests and then they have to perform. So making space for that becomes a challenge. Um, could I piggyback on Taran and Fatma? Um, um, I believe um, the parent power works in the policy decision too. So if we can remind ourselves of the what happened in Montreal in 1960s, uh, and the parents, they decided to teach their children their language at school. And now their children can speak French and English fluently. So um, a very similar situation happened in Korea uh, under a former president, Lee myung Bak, decided to make English as an medium of instruction in Korea from K to 12 levels. And the parents and teachers um, didn't agree with that idea. So still Korea teaches all students from K to 12 in Korean, not in English. And, um, but in university level, uh, English is, mm, Mostly English is the medium of instruction. So it depends on the levels of and levels and proficiency of the our students have. And also um, we can think about the decision is from the policymakers and also from the stakeholders. And the translingual practices has been there always, but the thing changed is just our perspective not from the deficit oriented, but as a resource of all the languages that we have already have. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you, Gion, for adding that uh, comments. Um, I think we have experienced that in Indonesia too, in uh, you know some places about the tension that um, we as teachers also experience uh, regarding language, language use, um, and how we, we, we deal with um, actually navigating our, uh, our identity as educator, where we provide the space for uh, varieties of languages, uh, all the linguistic resources that actually help us in making meaningful, meaningful uh, communication. Um, so I think right now I'm just, Want to provide the space for any uh, for all the presenters to have a closing remarks about their work before we end our session today. Um, anybody would like to 
start first. I guess I went first, so I'll start first with the closing okay, remarks. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> let's uh, go on based on the the uh, sure. presentation's role. Yeah, <laughs> go sure. ahead, Michelle. Yeah, it's very brief, but I just wanted to say that I'm really um, thrilled to see all of the comments and 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 I I share a lot of the concerns that's that that a lot of the teachers have about how can I make translanguaging work in 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 my classroom? What is that? What does that mean? And um, you know, kind of all and and then all of the problem. You know, how how does this relate to my students? What can I do with students studying abroad? And I was just um, commenting privately to one of the other presenters that I just wish we had more time to um, you know explore some of these issues a lot a lot more deeply but um, I think just as you know researchers were being reflective on our language practices I think it's important for you know teachers to also be reflective on their language learning experiences and their language practices so that they can come with towards their students with you know with the empathy um, necessary to you know to to make to do teaching practices that allow um, allow their students to succeed, and I think that you know that's I think part of the 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 transformative nature of, of something like translanguaging because it gives students that advantage to harness all of their linguistic resources in a way that they can make meaning um, from from the content and and hopefully you know be be able to you know acquire that content and. Um, in a successful way. So, so I really appreciate all of the, all of, a big shout out to all of the teachers out there. So I really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you, Michelle. And we continue to Maria. Yes, um, I just wanted to, um, ah, just wanted to make sure I was uh, not muted. Um, I wanted just to continue the conversation around accents. I think that um, I'm just thinking of my own experience in learning English as a second language many moons ago when I was little, I was like seven. I think that if we as teachers can help our students understand, you know, why our tongues won't say certain words, and it's about the phonology of that first language that has left you know, an imprint on your tongue. Like for me, TH was impossible because that's a configuration that does not occur in European Portuguese, right? So um, so I think that if we, and we just talk about it, it's not anything wrong with you. It's just, you, you have the evidence of a lot of languages on your tongue and how wonderful. So that's an aside, but important. Um, I wanted just to, I guess, go back to this, you know, I, I appreciated all the presentations and thank you all for sharing your work uh, this evening very, uh, in my case, this evening, the morning for you. But um, this idea of translation, transcription, analysis, and that we really need to be careful not to think of this as a very linear process, but it's very recursive. Um, and sometimes you might be, and analysis is always implicated. I always tell my students, the minute you go into a, a space and you have decided this is what you want to understand, your gaze is analysis. So I think that we need to, you know, really disrupt this idea that these are linear or that this, you know, these steps that you follow, but that we're doing it in very recursive ways. There's back and forth and around. So thank you again, sorry, for allowing us to make all of this visible. Thank you, Maria. Um, next, uh, I think the, the next one is uh, John and <clears throat> John and Tehran. Okay, yeah. Well, th thank you, first of all, my, my final thoughts are thank you to the organizers and to all the, the audience members. There seems to be a lot of participants have come, which is really good, you know, wish we had a little bit more time. One, one thing that just keeps in my mind from today's discussions and presentations is the idea of, you know, like we as practitioners in research or in the classroom are trying to legitimize the use of uh, various languages, you know, um, which is a very, very positive thing. But as I think Dr. Park was saying in her comments just a few minutes ago, the different stakeholders may have very conservative attitudes about what we're doing. <laughs> and they may have very strict conservative monolingual policies in place and how that pushes back, that resistance against what we think is very legitimizing, they may push back against it. 
and how we deal with that. And I, I think that's one thing that just stays in my mind. Theron. Yeah, I think I want to reflect the same uh, sentiment. Thank you very much for holding the seminar. It seems like the questions have been very insightful. Um, and it seems like everybody's engaged with the content. The presentations have all been very interesting. This is my first time to encounter some of this research because we didn't necessarily get access to all of the chapters in the book. So it's been nice to see how other people have approached um, the question of investigating multilingual research practice. It's been a really insightful uh, morning and now into the afternoon for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, John and Teron. And um, Brian? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think first, yes, thank you everybody for this work and this volume and everybody and the conversation we've had. What comes to mind is just that, you know, this, this sort of general struggle that we are in the world to try to create more just, equitable, open, loving societies is constantly there. Um, of course, in the US and many other con contexts, we have seen in the last several years, like a resurgence of, that's a resurgence always there, but uh, maybe intensifying of, of, of these conservative attitudes that John mentioned and so on. And, and I think uh, the result or the response that we can bring as researchers is, you know, sort of like a revolution is the, the work of humanizing and bringing voices and amplifying and trying to just ensure that when that conservative voice rises up that says, hey, this accent shouldn't be, or you shouldn't speak here, or don't let students do this, or, um, you know, let's, this student isn't doing well because of whatever, let's kick him out of the university or whatever. Um, you know, we can bring research that says that, hey, this, these are the real struggles of, of the people. We need to be more sympathetic. We need to be understanding. We need to be loving. And this is what can result as a, as a world in which, um, you know, the reality of a multilingual population that is by far the majority of the world's people is um, seen as the norm and is valued throughout. And um, we just keep moving in the direction of a, of a more peaceful community. Thank you, Brian. Uh, now let's hear from Jion and Jehyun. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Samuel and Sari, for all your work. And I really loved listening to all every presenter's uh, works, not in person, but by Zoom, which is our new normal. And um, I keep thinking about the metaphor we used in our chapter and um, one of them is English as a bridge. So I would go with that metaphor for our conclusion today. And um, now I'm grading uh, students' works for finer works. And the graders keep saying about how can we deal with this um, online translating works done by students. And we are struggling with this issue because we know it was translated from Google, not by themselves. And it's about writing uh, assignment. So maybe in the future, we need to consult AI to solve this question, mm -hmm. but we, we need to keep thinking about this CMC context as a translingual researchers too. Thank you. I was very uh, honored to share our ideas with, with um, many great scholars and students there. I, every presentation was very inspiring and I was kind of motivated. So let's keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you, Jay. Uh, Bob Mateus. Yeah, uh, thank you all. So it is an inspiring uh, talk today. Uh, my closing. Uh, so working with multilingual data can be a neck of betrayal, but the betrayal uh, can be worthy in terms that we can broker our uh, We become a broker for our culture to be presented to the international audience. So if you are non-English native speaker, so uh, believe in yourself, you can be a broker of our own culture to be brought uh, to the international audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat Mateus and uh, Fatma. 
Um, yep, as everyone else has said, I just want to say thank you to Sari and Beth for giving us uh, the chance to talk about these things for, for myself that have plagued me since my PhD and my postdoc. It's just constantly, how do I do this? How do I deal with the data? But also, how do we make it visible to other people, the kinds of efforts we have to make to bring this data as, as it turns up in publications? Um, and just to... Um, Follow up on, uh, Maria made a really nice point, um, and this was a point I was trying to make when I was doing the diagram about the translation transcription, that it's not one, two, three, but that's obviously how you have to show it in the methodology, but it's a linear thing then, it goes again and again and again, and sometimes the way you translate is influenced by the point you're trying to make. You're not betraying the original Arabic or the original Swahili, but you have to, as uh, Mateus just said, broker, how, how do I make this accessible to people so they understand the participants? So you're being this cultural broker, this ambassador, this translator, this so many skills for the multilingual researcher. And I think we definitely need to shift uh, the lens of research or what makes a researcher for multilinguals to recognize and appreciate the work and the immense pressures multilingual researchers have to go through. And with that, we also need to bring some kind of uh, rigorous or uh, rigor terms like was this translated rigorously? What was the translator thinking when they were doing this? Is, has this been presented authentically? But we can't have that kind of conversation unless we make space for the reality of the challenges of multilingual data. But I think the future's bright, and I think as long as we keep working and working together, I think that we can make some kind of um, creative innovation um, in the field. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, and I would like to welcome Beth to give up a closing statement of final remarks about our, um, yeah, related to the topic that we discussed today, Beth? Well, I, I appreciated what, what, um, what Dr. Sal said brought up about uh, the, 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 the movement that really got started this summer in the United States, but ha which has spread around the world. And we have had a lot of conversations here about racial privilege. And, um, and about giving up racial privilege and white privilege and so forth. And I want to see that trans, I want to see it expand into also talking about linguistic privilege that, that there's nothing wrong with having a lingua franca, but the privilege of um, having, having um, you know, native speaker uh, proficiency in a particular version of that language, right, uh, is something that, that we need to, we need to get beyond, we need to give that up and, and, uh, and make, and it's not just about making space, it's, it's because making space can be condescending. It's really, what is, what is a multilingual translingual university? What does it look like? What does it look like when um, people can work in several languages, work in a lingua franca, but it doesn't have to be a national language. It doesn't have to be the national language of the UK or the United States or some other um, former colonial power, right? We, we just have so much work to do to, um, to, to you know, I, I hate to use the word make. It's, it's really like pushing, pushing, pushing open that space to, to create um, the opportunities to do to do the, the work that we do, to do it rigorously, rigorously to talk about it, um, and to um, to encourage people to do their work in multiple languages. That it's just it's normal. It's what it's what should be done. If you are only doing your work in one language, you are the oddity. That's my goal, right? I would like to see that. Sorry, and I've talked about this. <laughs> linguistic yeah. terms right like it should be marked if you if you're a monolingual researcher it should be marked I mean people should go well what's wrong with you <laughs> you know <laughs> not the other way around right <laughs> yeah I mean uh, how how can you how can you possibly understand if you're doing ethnographic work or linguistic work of any form how can you possibly understand how people make meaning if you're only working in one language right yeah as a yeah, very nice closing and um, the point that we're trying to make in all our work um, in this uh, book. So again, I'm really glad to have, uh, well, not all the authors of the book, but most of us are here, I, at least re representing the, uh, the researchers from all over um, 
the continent. So we have uh, actually researchers from Australia and UK, and it's just like some of the uh, the time zone is just, you know, it's just hard to get all people, even though this has been a, a very productive med medium of uh, discussion, I think, because um, we can just all go online and have this discussion. So we have some other researchers who contributed to our book and but were not able to uh, participate in here. But I think maybe in the next um, conferences, I hope to see uh, many of you here and um, actually just have a, a networking and and uh, some of the works maybe that we can do together to uh, continue this work. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to work with Beth co-editing this book, as well as reading your articles, your chapters. It's been a pleasure. I learned a lot and, um, you know, learned so much from what you have done with your research. Again, thank you very much for being here. Some of you might be closing to um, the middle of the night. It's almost 12, I think, in the United States in Eastern time. So I really appreciate Michelle back and Maria, who's been here until the end. And I really appreciate Fatma, who came, you know, because that was it was 4 a.m. in um, in her uh, time zone. Mm -hmm. So some of us came really early and some of us stay really late for this discussion. So for that, I'm really thankful. And also, I would like to extend my uh, gratitude to Professor Huzaima Deem, um, the coordinator of uh, Southern region of Sumatra Teflin, who facilitated our discussion today and to make our work, um, you know, available to those who might not have access to uh, this work yet. And I'm thankful to all my students who are, uh, who has helped me to organize this event and also to my colleague Artanti and some other who were not in this um, Zoom, I mean, but they were participants. So thank you again for all your um, hard work and uh, giving me the opportunity to organize this. Um, thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I hand it over to Nimas, our host today. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much to all our moderator, Ibu Sari Silviani, and all the distinguished presenters for such worthwhile discussion. Now we've come to the end of today's webinar, but before we dismiss this webinar, uh, I'd like to have some documentations, like taking some pictures for uh, from all the presenters and committees. Please turn on your camera. We'll take two pictures on my count. One, two, three. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Thank you very much to all the presenters and the committees, as well as the participants who have already participated in this webinar. Now, uh, we've really come to the end of our webinar, and I'd like to announce some information for the participants that uh, we also have, we still have another webinar on this coming next Saturday. Yes, next Saturday on 19th of December. And it will be about the new normal in education, innovations and best practices in challenging times. So uh, we will provide the link to the registration form in the chat box, or you can also uh, update from our, get, get the update from our social media. So please make sure that you follow our social media, like our Instagram account and uh, subscribing to our Insta, uh, sorry, Telegram channel, SRS Stephen official, as well as our YouTube channel to replay. Probably you uh, missed some parts of this webinar, so you can rewatch it from our YouTube channel, SRS Stephen channel. All right, uh, that is all. I really appreciate all the presenters as well as the as well as the participants for your attendance here. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. See you on our next online event. Bye. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Sari. Thank you, thank you, thank you Beth. Thank you, Pak Matius. So, Hi, all. Great to thank see you. you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good night.
good night and good afternoon <laughs> yeah good dm thank good you grand pakalalikum okay tehran jian ryan john jeyun thanks thank you even though it's late it's hard to say goodbye <laughs> Yeah. Hari say hello to you Beth. Oh, hello, hello. Hari. Hello. <laughs> yeah.